Hello, and welcome to the final day of Grains Week. This is Alice Formiga of Eat Organic, and I'm going to briefly introduce our event before we start today's first session. So Grains Week is a collaboration between many organizations and universities. The Culinary Breeding Network, Cascadia Grains, the Artisan Grains Collaborative, Grow NYC and Glenwood, eOrganic, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Oregon State University and Cornell University, and Washington State University Food Systems. Funding has been provided by two USDA NIFA OREI grants, Multi-Use Naked Barley for Organic Systems, and Value-Added Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems. And here is our organizing team. Um, I'd like to thank all of them for putting together our incredible program. Bridget Mainz of Oregon State University. She leads the Naked Barley Project. Mark Sorrells of Cornell, who leads the Value Added Grains Project. Julie Dawson of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Julia Raggio of Grow NYC. June Russell of Grow NYC and now Glenwood, um, Alyssa Hartman of the Artisans Grains, the Artisan Grains Collaborative, Cassie Wolheiser, who produced our program. And we couldn't have done any of this without our incredible producer and project manager, Abba Kaiser of WSU Food Systems and Cascadia Grains, and of course, Lane Salmon of the Culinary Breeding Network, who brings so many people from different parts of our food system together. So yesterday, um, Abba gave a land acknowledgement from um, where she is in Washington, but since I'm speaking to you from Corvallis, Oregon, I'd like to acknowledge that Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. If you would like to find out what native people stewarded the land that you are on, you can text your zip code to the number on your screen and you can find out. And apparently this map isn't perfect, but it is a start. So um, Grains Week is going to be recorded so you can watch all the previous sessions from earlier this week on the Culinary Breeding Network YouTube channel. Where where you are now. And we encourage you all to post questions in the YouTube chat and also to communicate with each other because we very much hope that this event will enable you to make more connections and learn from each other as well as from our speakers. So with that, um, I'm going to pass over the um, mic here to June Russell, who is facilitating our first session. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for that great introduction. And I think, um, yep, Mary Hall's in the waiting room, it looks like. We've got you in here, Mary Hall. Do you want to turn on your camera? We'll just do a brief tech test here. And while we do that, I'm going to just get this video pulled up. So we're ready to go. Mary, hey. Hall, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Okay. I'm going to give an introduction and we'll play the video that, that Mary Hall has prepared for us and uh, hopefully we'll catch her on the other side. 
Um, Mary Hall Martins manages Lakeview Organic Grain, an organic animal feed and seed operation in Pena, New York, with her younger son, Daniel Martins. They ship organic dairy and chicken feed in upstate New York and northern Pennsylvania and organic crop seed throughout the Northeast. Most of their grain supply comes directly from regional organic farmers. Additionally, Mary Howell, her husband Klaus, and their older son Peter farm 2,000 acres of certified organic grains, dry beans, forage, and processing vegetables. They have been farming organic since 1992. So this is a real treat to have Mary Hall Martins. Uh, the whole Martins family has been incredible mentors to us here in the Northeast uh, grains world. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon, folks. Um, this is, uh, my name is Mary Hall Martins. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a different topic pertaining to organic grains, local grains, and how this um, is important for farm viability and for the health of the organic and local grains community. And it may be from a different perspective than what you're expecting, um, but I think it's very important for everybody, farmers and researchers and those supporting the industry to hear a different perspective. And that is from the feed grain side because not all grains that are gonna be grown in the area will meet food grade. And some of them will need to find another home and find another profitable, viable home for the sake of the farmers. And uh, there is a strong feed grade demand in the Northeast. Um, we operate a um, organic feed mill in half for the past 25 years. Um, buying from mostly local farmers, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio farmers, and, and selling it to uh, organic dairy farms, chicken farms, and backyard type uh, operations, um, those uh, raising a few chickens um, or, or more. Uh, there, I've got quite a few who are sort of in the intermediate size um, that are doing market uh, production of meat and eggs. And that consumes a great deal of grain, um, tonnage wise, uh, more than what the uh, specialty food grains do. And it has allowed the conversion of, of a lot of acres um, and, and the um, diversion of grains that don't meet the food grade market can go to feed. So I'm gonna start a PowerPoint and talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, and um, then we'll talk a little bit more about the different grains. So bear with me as I start my PowerPoint, please. Okay, um, so it's a 30 year adventure. My name is Mary Hal Martins again. Uh, our business um, that I'm talking about today is Lakeview Organic Grain. It's an organic feed and seed operation in uh, Penyan, New York. We serve um, the feed needs of farmers in New York and Northern Pennsylvania bulk feed. And then we serve feed and seed needs of farmers throughout the Northeast. We ship a lot to New England, to Maine, um, down into Pennsylvania. Um, so our, our range is pretty wide and we, um, we go through a lot of grain, a lot of organic grain in a year. Um, yeah. Uh, you will hear more about our farm, uh, Klaus. My husband will be speaking also in this program um, about our farm, the, the crops we grow, the way we grow them. We uh, farm, we and our older son farm about uh, 2,000 acres, a um, little bit more than 2,000 acres this year of certified organic grain and processing vegetables. And we have been certified since 1992. So we've been at this for a while. But again, what I'm talking about is Lakeview Organic Grain. In 1996, the first organic dairy farmers in New York came to us and told us that they needed a source of high quality organic feed. Um, they knew that we grew corn, we grew soybeans, um, had some, some wheat and some, some triticale, and they asked us if we'd start making feed for them. Um, working with a, a, a another uh, farmer, a neighbor for a while, um, we started developing developing kind of a seat of the pants uh, feed operation. In 2001, 
we had uh, enough customers and enough volume to justify in town as Agway was going bankrupt. And since 2001, we've been running it as a um, dedicated certified organic feed mill. Um, we're grinding more feed here uh, than Agway ever did in its heyday. And all of it is certified organic, absolutely all of it. And most of it is made out of uh, local, locally grown corn, soybeans, peas from outside the area but we try as much as possible to buy from local farmers. We also sell a lot of seed, um, both uh, corn and soybeans, but also small grains, cover crops, pasture grasses. And that is to uh, continue to serve the needs of the farmers in the area for their, their diverse needs, whether they are livestock farmers or grain farmers, everybody needs seed and the vegetable farmers need cover crops. So we're trying to uh, assemble a, a lineup of uh, products that will help with the, the convenience and the viability of the local farms. Um, for the past three years, our younger son, Daniel, uh, is working with me at the feed mill. So our older son works with Klaus, our younger son works with me. It's really kind of a nice situation. About uh, on our farm, about uh, three years ago, I sat Klaus and our older son down and I said, okay, let's, let's make a list of everything we, we grew you know, on our farm last year. And we started listing um, different uh, grains, different livestock, uh, and it went on and on and on and on. Um, and and the reason for this is not only do we grow a lot of things on our farm, but we grow for a lot of different markets. And we feel very strongly that this is our risk management, the diversity and the flexibility that all these different crops and all these different markets gives us, allows us to adapt to really whatever the weather throws at us, um, to a lot of the different market uncertainties that come along. Um, for instance, corn, we grow for food, we grow for distilling, for seed, for feed. Um, we sell some to taco makers for making masa out of. Um, all of these are different um, income streams that come at different times of the year. And they also allow us to save the very best quality grains for the higher value markets, the food grade markets, and then everything else. And on any farm, there's always a lot of everything else, um, that it still goes to a profitable market and that is the feed grade market. And um, this, is, this has really given us a package of um, products that we can go to pretty much every market out there and have something that they may, need, they may want to buy. And we don't get all of our income in one slug in the fall like many grain farmers do. We can spread our income out over 12 months which is good. We also can spread our labor out over 12 months, which is even better because labor is always a crunch on a farm. And if we cannot figure out ways to um, plant winter grains in the fall that are kind of on autopilot until they're harvested in October, in, in July, um, plant uh, corn and soybeans and oats in the spring, um, we, we have a hard time managing a, a, a compact labor force. That means not having more people than we need, but having enough people and managing uh, equipment need, our equipment needs in an efficient way um, by spreading out uh, when we harvest, when we plant, and, and when we have to cultivate. So diversity and flexibility are really the key to a viable farm. Um, Yes, we can go out and buy crop insurance. We have to, that's part of our the requirements um, for being part of the USDA programs, but that's just insurance. That's like buying health insurance. It doesn't keep you healthy. It just prevents you from, from paying a whole lot of money if things go wrong. The more important thing is to do things to be healthy um, proactively. And that's where the diversity comes in, doing the things on a farm that proactively help, help the management of the farm, spreading out our, our needs in, in time and labor and uh, markets. 
most of the time when we're talking about grains, people are thinking about small grains. And uh, it, it's kind of a um, catch-all phrase, um, but we can um, pare that down to really six different grains. Wheat, barley, triticale. Triticale or triticale is a um, intentional cross that was made back in the early 1900s between wheat and rye. Um, don't see that very often in the food grade market. It does show up sometimes in the, the seven grain bread or the 12 grain bread or things like that. It's very important in the feed market, both as a grain and also as a forage, uh, something that can be chopped and fed to dairy cows. It's a very easy grain to grow in the Northeast and it makes a very nice rotational crop because it gives you a point to put clover in, which is uh, an important um, cover crop needed for nitrogen in the soil. It also can be mixed with Austrian winter peas, planted in the fall, and then harvested for forage in the spring. It's, it's a good way of using the land more, more uh, intensively, um, but not in a way that strips nutrients out of the land. Um, of these grains, what's important to note is that two, three of them are um, edible as they come out of the field, and three of them need further processing. Um, and I, if, if, if I was with you in person, I would ask for hands um, as far as if you knew which ones were which. Um, but uh, in short, wheat, triticale, and rye come out of the field uh, pretty much usable as they are. Barley, spelt, and oats uh, are require further processing, they, need, they require dehulling, and as do the specialty grains, emmer and einkorn. Um, that means that additional equipment is needed, an additional step that um, most farmers don't have. And, and so uh, it's, it's not hard for farmers to grow barley, um, oats and spelt, but turning them into food is a little bit more of a challenge. However, barley and oats do not need to be beheld for the feed market. So uh, some people would prefer the, the convenience of just harvesting their barley and their oats and bringing it to like the organic grain and being done with it, getting, getting it sold, not having the um, additional step and the additional time, the additional cost, and, and perhaps the, the chance of not meeting quality specs. And I'm gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so, uh, again, small grains can be grown for a lot of different markets, a lot of different purposes, um, but don't lose sight of the fact that animal feed consumes a great deal of small grains um, and pretty much all the corn uh, and soybeans grown in New York. Why grow small grains? Um, to break pest cycles, to improve weed control. Um, to improve organic matter, to add uh, diversity, intentional biodiversity, to spread out workload and um, as a cover crop. Um, at a different point in, in this conference class, my husband will be talking about organic no-till, the idea of growing a small grain, uh, a, a winter grain like rye, and then in the, planting it in the fall and then rolling it down in uh, spring um, with a, a special device that rolls and crimps it down into a mat and then planting um, dry beans or soybeans into it uh, that will uh, then grow uh, with the, the mat of the rolled grain forming um, a weed control. And so there are no more um, field operations are needed. That's a very interesting technique of, of controlling weeds in organics um, with a minimal amount of disruption to the soil, which is important um, if that can be built into a rotation. But I want to talk more today about quality because quality is something, grain quality is something that a lot of farmers, uh, uh, it's, we, we all as farmers are conditioned to um, put a lot of effort into the agronomics, the growing, the harvesting, um, the, looking at our, our, our amber waves of grain and being proud of that. Um, our buyers, however, are much more interested in whether the grain coming out of the field, coming out of your bins, is suitable for the market, for the intended purpose. Uh, for food grades, for things going to bakeries and distilleries 
and um, to, to malt houses. The quality specs are very high. The grain has to be very clean. It has to um, be free from mycotoxins, which are fungal toxins. It has to, uh, if for the malting uh, market, has to meet um, certain germination qualities and protein qualities for the, the for food, for, for baking, it, the grain needs to meet uh, falling number and other protein specs. All of that um, can be some years very hard to do if the weather goes against you or if you have deterioration in storage. Um, mycotoxins especially are a um, serious problem some years when it is wet in the spring. And that may very well mean that um, your grain doesn't meet the tolerances needed for food grade. Um, what, I, what I've asked a lot of people is, you know, you, you're growing barley for the malting industry. That's good, that's great. Um, but what if the, you grow 100 tons of uh, malting barley and your, your malting, malt house only wants to take 10 tons? Um, what do you do with the other 90 tons? And, and that is an important question. What do you do with the other grains? Think about what, what other markets there are. And for us, um, we buy a lot of uh, food grains that have fallen out of condition or people who are grains from people who are also grown for the food market. Um, mycotoxins are a big issue and it's something that we need to all educate ourselves on. Fung different fungal molds um, can infect a plant infect a grain. Uh, oftentimes when that grain, when that wheat or that triticale is in bloom. Now that's a hard concept because most people don't see flowers on wheat, but it's when the grain heads look a little fuzzy. And if it's wet during that time, um, there can be uh, molds that uh, start to infect the kernel as it grows. And uh, the big one in the Northeast is fusarium um, that can cause vomitoxin, also known as Don, or, and, and a number of other mycotoxins. They are colorless, odorless. They do not smell like mold. They, you, can, you don't know that you've got them until your buyer tells you that um, you've got a problem. And the tolerance for food grains uh, food quality baking um, is essentially zero. If you have any vomitoxin in your wheat, a bakery does not want it. Um, the tolerance in feed is a little bit higher. It's still not zero. It's still not nothing. I mean, you, you, you've got, you, you can't put toxic grain in animal feed, um, but we can use uh, grain that has a little bit higher levels. Um, and, and it can be a problem on corn. It can be a problem on um, most of the small grains. I don't see it on soybeans, um, but uh, there, this is something that farmers need to know what mycotoxins are and why they form, how they far, form, and what they can do to um, create conditions for maximum health um, of uh, feed uh, of, of the grains as they grow, because the stronger the plants, the more vigorous, healthier the plants, the less likely there's going to be a problem. One of the things we talk about is in a concept called fuss factor. Um, the greater the value you get from a grain um, or for any product that you, anything you do, the greater the value um, it has to do with the how much is required. And food quality grains have much more exacting requirements that take more time, they take more attention to detail, but there is much higher risk. Um, and therefore there is a potentially higher loss. Um, the nice thing about fuss factor is that there's often less competition um, to meet those high value markets, but you do stand the risk of, of losing more. Um, we try to do both. And we try to give our buyers what they want and um, make, make uh, our products as, as high quality as possible. But when they don't make that, you know, we have an alternative. Another specialty product that we have gotten into is producing seed. And um, there are additional requirements for seed quality grains, um, germination, vigor, P 
purity, that means freedom from noxious weeds or farm material that are true to the variety. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that um, if you grow product or grains for seed, especially small grains, um, seed laws have serious teeth to them. Um, you do not want to just save whatever you happen to buy and call it that. Um, if you buy a, a new variety of wheat and you save back seed, you cannot go out and uh, then sell that as, as that variety, because in most cases, there are patents on that seed. And so you you if, if you're going to grow seed, uh, grains for seed quality, it's very important to, to know the requirements. Um, they're as high or higher than food grains, and also to know what the seed laws are and the requirements as far as inspection of the fields and meeting um, the, the, the certified seed standards, because breaking those laws is no small thing. And it's very important to know that ahead of time. Um, so I think I'm at my 20 minutes and uh, I, I would like to um, take questions. Um, and, and we will we will definitely discuss any any things that, that people want. There, we have a lot of articles we have written over the years um, posted on our website. And we've written a lot of articles about grain quality, about animal health, about crop rotation and a number of other things, plus some philosophical things. And so if you have any further questions, you can go to our website and uh, see some of those articles. If you have specific questions, you can email me at mh at lakepeorganicgrain.com. I'd be happy to carry on conversation that way. Um, we also have a fairly active Facebook page. So uh, feel free to, to like us on Facebook um, because we are there. And uh, we would be happy to interact about for, with people who are interested in uh, the potential for growing feed quality grains in the Northeast. Thank you. All right, we are back. Back, okay. Do we have Mary Howell this time? Let's see if we can get your video going. Okay, well, oh, there. Hi, Mary Hall. Okay, you're on mute. We're almost there. Um, okay, are you off? Did you come off mute? I can't hear you still. Okay. Mary, I'm going to post the um, number in the chats if you want to call in. And um, yeah, meanwhile, June, if you want to um, just talk a little bit of, maybe about how you m met Mary Howell and just what your y'all's relationship is here. Oh, sure. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, I met Mary Howell in 2008. I think she was one of the first people that I, that I spoke with uh, when I was... Uh, I think it was even a, not directly a grains issue. I had something else to do with something I was working on in inspections. Um, but I had some questions about corn production and uh, one of our vendors at, at Green Market said, well, you have to talk to Mary Howell. Mary Howell's the expert. So I called her up and uh, she told me about a field day that they were having and I had a trip on the books to be up to the Finger Lakes. Um, so I stopped by their farm and uh, Klaus was in the field giving a pasture talk, which you know, was certainly life-changing. Anybody who's, who's listened to Klaus Martens talk about grass, for example, or anything. Um, and I met Mary Howell as well, and she introduced me to a grain called Emmer, and I picked up a, a sack of Emmer and brought it down for a baker to, to work with. And have known them since. So it's been quite a while. Um, you know, you always look forward to seeing them at the NOFA New York conference or any conference in the winter circuit. And, and I've really, the 
the family, all of them, Mary Howell, Peter, Klaus, have been so essential to our uh, work here in the Northeast and wonderful mentors, very generous with their knowledge, um, a, a real, real incredible family. And um, they provide so much uh, good um, food for us, number one, um, but also a, a lot of resources and support to organic growers and, and growers who are looking to transition in organic. Um, let's see if we have Marianne some volume now. Are you there? There you go. Oh gosh darn. Of course it's uh it's our Zoom just 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 being super tired after a long week here. <laughs> but hopefully we'll get um, Mary Hall on the line in just a second. I just um, chatted you the number to call Mary Hall to call in via phone. Um, and I'm wondering if you have the answer to this question that's in the chat, June, um, from George Foner. Um, what are the prospects for including rye and triticale in the FHB mycotoxin screening nurseries and trials that are being done by U of Wisconsin and Cornell? Seems like that's a, a question maybe for our other colleagues who are not on the call at this point. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I do know that the University of Vermont actually would probably... I think they've, they've, I know that they have been doing some work on some rye varieties um, and we're just starting to look at those. I think Cornell might have a few in, in the field trials that's happening, um, but I'm sure that Heather Darby and her crew would be a good resource um, for, for questions there. This is, this is definitely a crop that is moving more towards food grade, but has been a very big hit with uh, distillers. Um, and of course, of course, it's important for our farmers to have um, options of those different varieties. Okay, there's a phone. I'm here. Yay! And uh, Mary, if you can just mute, um, mute your other audio, that would be great. So there's not an echo. Okay, I can do it. Okay, can I be heard? Yes. And can, okay. Yeah, uh, Mary, there's still a little bit of a, a, an echo. If you can mute whatever other device is playing um, other than the phone. Okay, I'm going to try to. Okay, what are... Okay. Um, there we go. What are the questions? There okay. we go. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and bearing with us here. I'll let Certainly. you Not a problem. Um, Mary Hall, here's a, a, we don't have a whole lot of questions in the chat yet, but how's the weather in Penyan today? Oh, it's, it's, it's beautiful because we are in the middle of early spring and everything's in bloom. Our lilacs are in bloom. Uh, and the oats that we planted a week, uh, a month ago are coming up and they look really good. The winter grains made it through the winter all in great shape. Uh, we're, it looks like we're um, not seeing much in the way of winter damage at all on the barley or spelt. Um, so we're feeling really encouraged about this year. We've gotten some rain in the past week. Um, that's certainly going to help. And uh, we're, so far, uh, this is turning out to look like a pretty good season for us. Um, it's probably in the 50s today, so you know it's not the warmest day on record, but still, it's a it's a good day. It's a spring, and and that's good. I see a couple of questions. George Boner is asking about the mycotoxin screening of triticale. He and I carry on regular conversations about this, and um, so I, I I I'm hoping that there is. Uh, good work being done at Cornell in Wisconsin um, about uh, with triticale to try to screen for mycotoxin resistance. I know that there's been some work. Um, I do think that some of the newer varieties are showing real promise. Um, as far as, if nothing else, um, bloom date, uh, which changes the susceptibility uh, to mycotoxins. Um, that is something that we really need uh, work to be done on. 
triticale, unfortunately, is not as as popular a, a crop to do much breeding on because it's not terribly high profit, but it, it is something that uh, there is some work being done. I see that Sarah Cox has a question about um, whether we work with farmers with, for, with transitional grain. I wish we could. Uh, as a certified organic grain mill making animal feed, uh, we would have to do and document complete clean down of our equipment if we were to um, make feed out of transitional feed and then switch over to feed made out of organic feed. Most of the people I'm seeing around here uh, are going uh, transitioning land and having transitional grain sell it into the non-GMO market. And and that's actually a pretty good uh, market for making feed. There's a a Mennonite feed mill north of here that is not organic. They're non-GMO. And uh, they're selling mostly bagged feed to people who want backyard chicken feed and stuff like that, but don't care whether it's certified organic. So what I have seen is most of the the transitional crops seem to be going in that direction. And it is somewhat premium in price, but not as premium as organic. Um, so, you know, there, the, 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 the options out, are out there for finding ways to transition to organic uh, and still have it not be three years of having to sell it into the conventional market because the non-GMO market is actually something that's growing quite, quite soundly right now. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, I sure. I'll keep throwing questions at you, Mary Hall. It's always such a pleasure. That's okay. To hear you. Um, where have you seen any any growth areas uh, like, like in the last year or so, or maybe even connected with COVID? <laughs> Some more oh, right Right now, uh, organic grain prices are absolutely going crazy. And this has just been within the past month. Um, and it has more to do with um, shipping disruptions than it does um, uh, anything else um, at this point. Uh, shipping disruptions of imported grain coming into the country. Um, not that we buy imported grain ourselves. But a lot of the the operations uh, growing, the big chicken and big uh, dairy operations in California and the Southwest uh, buy a lot of imported organic soybeans, and that has that supply has been really disrupted with containers not moving from India and China like they should this winter, and so those operations have been pulling hard on the domestic supplies because they've got animals to feed. And that has driven up prices on anything that has protein in it. And it's not just the soybeans, it's peas, it's flax, it's canola, it's anything that is a protein source. And so um, organic grain prices ha- are, are very volatile right now. Uh, and, and for people who've been holding back on their crops and not selling them, they're making really good money right now. Whether that's going to continue, probably not. Uh, when when shipping disruptions level out a little bit and uh, supply starts coming in from South America, I, I don't think the grain prices are going to be where they are right now. But right now, um, it's 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 really profitable um, for people who are still have grains to sell. Um, we do contract everything in advance, so I'm not responding here at Lakeview to the volatile market. I don't think it's fair um, to our dairy farmers and our chicken farmers to have their feed prices bouncing all over the place. So my goal at Lakeview is always to keep things as stable as possible uh, and, and so that our, our, our livestock farmers, our, our chicken farmers, can, can anticipate uh, their costs because they can't adjust what they're making. Uh, they can't just suddenly ask for more money from their egg buyer or their milk buyer. Um, so we're trying to keep things pretty, um, pretty responsible and pretty level for them. It's great. Mm-hmm. Interesting times. Um, it is interesting times, no <laughs> doubt about that. Um, congratulations on the latest family business with Seneca Grain and Bean. 
Oh yeah, Seneca Grain and Bean is is our son Peter's business. Uh, and it's, it'd be worth going onto that website if you haven't seen it yet. It's lovely. Um, Peter's uh, number one employee is a, also a um, website guru, and so he's put together a very, very pretty uh, new website. He's selling. Um, they're going to be selling the food grains. That's one of the things that we've, for years, been asked to be able to sell here at Lakeview. Um, people hear that we're growing uh, heritage grains and beans, and they think that you know because I'm part of a farm that's doing that, we should be selling that here at Lakeview. Um, but that's not really compatible with a feed mill. Um, what what the rules are for food grade uh, grains are different than what they are for feed grade grains, and I don't really feel like I want to. Um, mix. I never wanted to mix the two. So I am very glad that Peter has spun off his own business and will be marketing direct uh, to consumers and also to bakeries, uh, wholesalers, uh, both uh, both uh, heritage grains, uh, de-held spelt, and other small grains, but also the dry beans like black, uh, black turtle soup, red kidney, and pinto beans. So this is this is a new opportunity. Peter is um, seeing where there are additional frontiers, which is um, wonderful. It's neat to see our our, our young men, so, our sons, uh, finding ways to find their own frontiers. We had ours uh, 30 years ago, and now they've got to find their own. <laughs> well, we're definitely excited about uh, Seneca Grain and Bean, and and always feel so fortunate to have uh, a business like e- Lakeview Organic available to our organic producers. Uh, I can say that in my travels around the Northeast, Lakeview Organic Grain is is well known and I've, I've seen your products uh, from the feed mill um, reaching far and wide across the region. So thank you for that. Well, we- we try to be an anchor. We try to have have a reliable integrity for the farmers so that they know um, where uh, that, that when they buy from us, they're buying reliably um, organic of high integrity and of high quality. I see uh, that Keith uh, typed in, uh, he'd like to know the name of Peter's company again. It's Seneca Grain and Bean. And they do have a website uh, of their own, so that if you go to Seneca Grain and Bean, you should be able to find that. And could you tell us a little bit about how you work with other farmers? Uh, how you contract, or do you make calls for crops if you see that there's demand that it's not being met? Um, anything I, farmers? We 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 work closely with a lot of farmers, and we have uh, a lot of long-standing ties. Uh, to uh, grain, uh, grain, grain farmers here in New York, and uh, we've got a good friend out in Ohio and also several good, good people in Pennsylvania. Um, they generally um, come to us. They know where we are, and they know that we buy grains directly out of the field um, at harvest for the small grains in August and July and corn and soybeans in October and November. Um, so we get a lot of calls, and we buy as much as we possibly can up to the capacity of uh, bin storage that we have. Um, that, that is always our limiting factor, uh, we're, how, much, how much space we have. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of um, not very glamorous, but that is the truth. Uh, after that, we uh, do contract for additional supply, because um, especially soybeans, there just simply aren't enough grown and, uh, in, in this area. So we do have to bring in some from outside the area, uh, but we're, um, you know, we, 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 we've been growing supply now for 25 years, and we'll work with farmers. We'll, we'll help them with uh, information about weed control, or with, about where to find seed and fertilizer and um, resources for uh, making the right decisions, and so we've we've helped a lot of farmers convert a lot of land. Yeah, that's essential. Um, just thinking of you know, since this project is focused on the small grains in particular, wonders what your thoughts are in terms of opportunities for small grains in 
animal feed in particular? We've, you know, it's I, I think that whenever anybody's thinking about growing wheat uh, as, as the, the premier small grain, they need to, before they plant, before they choose a seed variety uh, and plant it in the fall, they need to figure out where they want to sell it. Because one of the things that I found is, is organic wheat can be remarkably hard to sell if you do not have a market um, lined up ahead of time. Usually if you're, you're trying to sell it into the food grade market for, uh, to a bakery or to a buyer that is selling to bakeries, they are pretty um, specific about what varieties or at least what class of wheat that they want. Usually they want a hard red or a soft white or something that is a specific kind. If you just go out and buy whatever seed you happen to be able to find, um, oftentimes it's soft red, and that is not something that most food grade uh, processors are going to be wanting to buy. So be careful about finding a buyer and then asking them what they want and then plant that rather than grow what you feel like it feel like and then try to find a buyer for it. Um, usually it's better to to ask your buyer what they want. Um, as far as uh, the the barley 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 there's there's emerging opportunities for malting. Again, ask your buyer what variety they want because that matters enormously. Um, but then if it falls out of spec, if it's sometimes kind of hard to meet malting uh, specifications. If, if it's not something that uh, meets the malting when you get it harvested, when you get around to get it harvested, and it doesn't meet malting requirements, then um, finding an alternative market is important. Um, I'll buy any amount of barley that anybody wants to sell me, or certified, cert, certified organic barley, because I feel like it is, um, makes a really good feed grain, and there isn't that much grown here in the Northeast. But uh, it's, it's very important to work with a buyer and plant specifically what they're looking for uh, rather than just counting on the market to be there for you. I see that George is asking me to comment further about diversity um, as well uh, in respect to geographical diversity of supply. Um, there are some things I can't buy locally, things like um, peas feed peas. I love using peas, uh, both because I think that it's really good in dairy feed, it raises butter fat, but also we have a, a strong line of um, no-soy chicken feeds uh, for people who are trying to avoid using soybeans in their diet, and uh, peas are a key part of that. Unfortunately, peas don't grow well in the Northeast, so I do have to bring them in from outside the area. Uh, and, and there are other things like that that, you know, we are really good at growing many, many crops here in the Northeast. Northeast the Northeast is a rich area for um, being able to have diversity. Not everywhere is like that, but the, Pacific, the um, Canadian prairies are great for growing peas and flax and lentils and uh, some other pulses out there. So, we have to look at our geographic area and see what what is going to be best adapted to the area uh, and, and grow that. If you try to grow something that isn't well adapted to your area, oftentimes you run into problems with um, disease, with uh, poor yields, and it, it's, not, it's always best to find something that is, is good for where you are. But then um, see what the market is looking for. I don't know if that answered your question or not. I want to buy locally because it's not that I, I, have, I have to have local grains. What I have to have is local farmers. And so as much as anything, I'm cultivating the farmers, not just the grains. We, we need to build our own communities and be as regionally self-sufficient as possible. Here, here. It's probably a dream. It's a dream, but it's something that's a dream I've been working on for years. And I think that we, we all need to look at our, our area as, as the area that we need to support and the farmers in our area as those that, you know, we want to see thrive. Absolutely. That's the, the reciprocity that's, that's required of us, right? If we want local farms, we eat local food. Yeah, it's true. 
Um, yes, and, and and thank you for sharing your vision. I know I've, I've learned so much from you. Um, while I have you, this is a food grade question, but while I have sure. you, um, so I know that you um, were responsible for identifying a, a wheat called Frederick, which has been a pastry <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that has grown in popularity down here in New York City. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about uh, you discovering the Frederick and I, 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 I can't really say I discovered it. It's an older variety. It's a Canadian variety. But back um, 30 years or so ago, um, we were growing three different varieties of wheat for um, seed production, for certified seed production. It was actually before we were certified organic. And one of the uh, things about doing seed production is that you have to walk the fields and make sure that there are no noxious weeds or off types or other problems in the fields before harvest. So that that responsibility fell to me, and I was out walking um, the Frederick field, and there were two other varieties. And I came back in, and I was I was hot and tired and feeling kind of grumpy. And I said to Klaus, "What do these these three varieties taste like?" And uh, he looked at me bewildered because you know he didn't think of those that wheat as food. Uh, he it. it a lot of farmers, a lot of grain farmers, just simply do not see what is in their fields as something edible. It's not food. It's, it's corn. Well, corn isn't food. Soybeans isn't, aren't food as they come out of the field. But wheat can be. And so when we harvested the three varieties that year, um, I asked them to bring some in. And I had a little hand grain grinder. And I ground them, and I made three different kinds of bread. Uh, for us to taste. And what really struck us was that the Frederick, which is a soft white winter wheat, had a a very unique flavor. It was um, mild and almost corn-like, buttery, sunshiny. It was delicious. And uh, so we started using it for our own um, because I make a lot of bread. I grind our own wheat into flour and and then um, make bread out of it. And we were just doing it because we enjoyed it. And then we had a friend come up. Um, He was writing a book, and he was doing some research on the book. So he came up to our farm and hung out in our kitchen and had me cook for him for a while. And um, he tasted some bread that I'd made, or some cake I'd made out of it. And um, he just absolutely um, went into a trance (laughs) because celebrity chefs are like that. His name is Dan Barber, and he wrote The Third Plate. He is a celebrity chef um, in um, Manhattan and um, Hudson Valley. And uh, so he tasted the, um, the, the cake that I'd made out of Frederick Wheat, and he loved it. He said he'd, he'd always liked the idea of whole wheat, um, whole grains, but he'd never liked the flavor. Um, they always seemed too bitter or too aggressive to him, and uh, he just—it was kind of an epiphany for him to taste wheat, the the Frederick gr- fresh ground, and in in the cake because he just didn't expect that flavor, and so he started making um, whole grains, freshly ground whole grains, a key feature of the menus at Blue Hill and Stone Barns, and. Uh, once, one time, um, Danny Wegman, who is the owner uh, of the Wegman's chain of grocery stores, happened to be at Stone Barnes, and he tasted um, the flour made from Frederick Wheat and um, talked to Dan about it. And together they um, put together um, a, an initiative to use more locally grown whole grains in the artisan breads at Wegmans. And that has been a really good thing for a lot of farmers here in, in New York because that has provided a new market, a new um, high-value market for our locally grown grains. Uh, Frederick is a delicious wheat, but there are other delicious wheats. And what I, what I find neat is the whole idea of wheat being a varietal, just sort of like Chardonnay or Cabernet, or we all know wine varietals. Why shouldn't we know wheat varietals as being unique? Um, because there are unique flavors to them. 
And uh, that's something that I'd like to see more of, that when, when we buy a loaf of bread, we're not just buying something generic that doesn't taste like a whole lot, but that we buy a Frederick wheat or a um, Redeemer wheat or um, there are, a, you know, Glen wheat. There are different, different, different flavors in all these different wheat varieties. We should appreciate and, and celebrate that. Well, thank you. We're we're getting there slowly but surely. Um, <laughs> we had some sessions earlier this week on sensory evaluation of different varieties, and mm -hmm. um, you know, it's things have come a long way in in the past decade or so. Um, they really have, June. When I think about the the tasting that we were participating in at the um, French Culinary Institute down there, was it two thousand nine? Um, uh, January twenty. Yes. Okay. And, and we 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 just um, we were just really amateurs at it, and we have come along a, a long ways to understanding how to um, reach our customers and and tell them the story about grains as something that is worth valuing. Uh, that it's not it's not just it's not just bread, but it has flavor and it has quality. Yes, it does. Well, thank you, Mary Howell, for all of your wisdom to help us to elevate this ingredient and return um, grains to the foundation of our local food systems. <laughs> well, you're doing a good job, and this has been a very interesting conference. I've been listening to a lot of the talks, and well, it, is, it is it is fun to see all the information. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. We're going to sign off and okay. um, yeah, hope to see you uh, pretty soon. And, and good luck with your new, uh, new work, Joan, because um, you, wherever you go, you bring a, a, a tremendously important quality and knowledge. Well, thank you. Uh, look forward to new projects with you. Thank you. Yes, okay. that too. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And okay. goodbye to all.
Jennifer Lapidus and everybody else who I can't see. How are you, Jen? Welcome to Grains Week and our book talk about Southern Ground. Hey, Jen, how are hey, you? Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So good, good, we're good. just here for a second to say hello, universe, and welcome to the book talk that they're going to air in a second. So here's Jen in the virtual flesh and me in the whatever I am. Um, <laughs> and we'll be back. If you have questions, please drop them into the chat. And I, Amy Halloran, and Jennifer Lapidus. Fabulous author, Miller, <laughs> Baker, Carolina Ground founder will answer them for you to the best of our abilities. So please enjoy this. <laughs> Hi, I am so excited to be with you, Jen. I'm Amy Halloran, and here is Jen Lapidus, the founder of Carolina Ground Flour Mill in Asheville, Cal. Asheville, North Carolina, <laughs> um, and the author of a beautiful new cookbook that uh, we've all been waiting for in the regional grain movement. I think that um, the arrival of Southern Ground is just perfect, and congratulations on getting it here. Um, will you tell us a bit about the book, Jen, and how yeah. it evolved? Yes, yeah, um, thank you. And I do feel like I should show the cover and <laughs> I'm just gonna, it's propping up my computer. So, um, but just so we can see, um, and the, the cover, it says reclaiming flavor through stone milled flour. So, um, okay. It's back to propping up my computer. It's very good. This book. <laughs> but, um, anyways, yeah, this is, a this for me, um, has been a really long story um, because, yeah, I mean, it, the story for me goes back all the way to, all the way to the 90s, but all the way to when I started my bakery um, and I was milling in-house and um, because I was a whole grain, naturally leavened bread baker, um, Flemish bread called Daisum and, um, and fresh flour, stone ground was sort of my first ingredient that, you know, the essential ingredient for this bread that was just flour, water, and sea salt, um, which back in, I guess I was apprenticing in 1993 um, with Alan Scott, you know, back then there weren't that many people doing this. <laughs> so it's so exciting now to see both natural leavening and fresh flour really having their time you know this is it's finally we finally arrived but to be able to tell the story um has been uh a real a real treat you know to be able to give voice to what we're doing um and and you know and and tell the story of where we've been and where and and how how we've sort of i mean in the book is one third narrative and then two thirds recipes. So you're gonna get it from many of your sensories, hopefully will be engaged with this book. But, um, but on the narrative end, I do tell the story of Carolina Ground, which I see as, you know, really the regional grain story. It's just, I'm telling this grander story through the lens of what happened here in the South. Our mill, as you were, you know, Amy, you're so great about kind of realizing the different mill, you know, I, I know you'll like point to, you know, farmer ground that was sort of driven by, by the farmers and, you know, or, um, you know, really honing in on, you know, what is the driving force behind each iteration because Carolina ground, um, well, I should say farmer ground, Carolina ground's name was inspired by farmer ground because I had this idea. It was so early on, like everybody's going to have a, you know, there's going to be a, another ground, you know, there's going to be a Calif California ground or whatever, but that's so but, fun. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm such a huge fan of farmer ground. They're, yeah. Greg and Tor and Neil, they're just amazing. And, um, and such an inspiration to me, 
but, um, and, you know, there's main grains, what Amber's doing, and, you know, these, like, kind of early on iterations that we were all coming up, and they're really, we were trying to sort of, I mean, this was so foreign back 10 years ago. There's just, the bakers that were using our flour were a certain type of baker, you know, it wasn't going to be as easy as just picking up a bag of roller milled flour. And, you know, especially early on for us with, I mean, you know, the farmers are used to growing grain, but they're used to growing soft wheat for the feed market, you know, we're like I did, it's not in the book, but just things like, you know, doing grant writing to help get infrastructure in place for, you know, on farm to, in a scenario where there's also this like sort of missing element of like, okay, now we're looking at food grade versus feed grade. And what does that look like? Cause I just found a frog in my tote and, and the farmer's are like, well, what kind of frog, you know? And I'm like, the kind that shouldn't be in my tote. Like we can't have frogs in our totes. Like it was dead. It was a dead toad. I don't know what kind. Was just not, you know. Like, so, like, we were dealing with sort of, um, and so, anyways. I mean, you wouldn't know. It's it's hard to, and I, um, you know, I don't go in deep with this in the book at all. But it's it's hard to really um, capture how challenging it is to do what we do. I mean, you know, I imagine that if you were in a local form movement. Re saying, wow, these tomatoes taste great. Let's serve them. Like if you looked at the tomato and, and like when they were like, wow, how can we grow these tomatoes and, and send them to like 3000 miles away? They were like, oh, this is really hard. How do we get a tomato to still be okay? 3000 miles away, well, like wheat, it was like, oh, easy, right? Like we were the first one to become not localized, I mean, for so long, for so long, you know, and in America, it just made so much sense to do what we did, which was, you know, I mean, it made a lot of sense economically, efficiently, to just, you know, vertically integrate, centralize bread wheat production. We've got the, you know, big Midwest states or the um, bread basket, but, you know, we're also humans that should be, in community with food security and flavorful food and you know what happens when we just fully sort of um i don't know i think the removing the mill from the community was the first also piece of removing the community from the community it's it, and this that moment i'm always so fascinated with uh you know where did it happen um mm -hmm. as if i could time travel and make it unhappen. We certainly can't do that. It's And it's not what we're trying to do. Um, but it is so curious because grains have always been this kind of community and commodity coin um, right from their start. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have this great quote that I was looking at again yesterday about from a, a an entomologist who said, you know, it wasn't so long ago that every farmer would grow enough for his family and some to give to market. Mm -hmm. And now they can't do it because the wheat midge is attacking the grain. So that was that was 1850 in New York State and the um, Erie Canal had already ripped it away. Um, and even earlier, in, you know, we've just gotten away from that. And so the potential to restore it is is quite old, you know, and um, everything has gone away. N knowledge of not needing um, frogs in your, in your grain and, <laughs> you know, setting up mills. Uh, so what did you tell in the, in the narrative part? Tell us, right. tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I definitely told the story of how how our mill came to be. I mean, for me, I had pulled away from baking um, and I mean, in an interesting time, I had stepped away for, which isn't really mentioned, but I'd stepped away for reasons of, um, you know, my daughter was middle school age. 
I'd been baking for 14 years and I wanted to give her better access to schools outside of the rural community we were living in. So we moved into Asheville and, um, and Dave Bauer from Sparrow started his bakery in my space. Initially, we were both kind of sharing the space um, and I was commuting and, um, but he was telling me, so, you know, Dave and I would talk and he was telling me about, you know, God, you know, wheat is getting really hard to come by. Like it, the prices are high, the quality is terrible. And, you know, and then, um, so like, I knew that something was going on and I had my friend, Roger Jansen, who's, who's like a dear friend. He's, uh, I think, um, in his nineties now, is he? He's born in 1931. Roger built the mills for my bakery. And um, he used to, was a stone cutter at, at, um, at Meadows forever ago. And it's just a major creative. And, and he's, he's calling me up, hey, you know, there are these wheats in, in, at the USDA because he, he saw some growing in a field and he asked about it and he got them to send, you know, he's like, you got to try that. And I'm, Roger, I'm, I'm trying to get away from baking. And Dave, that's interesting, but I'm trying to get away from baking, you know? And then I, I sat down to get my hair cut um, and picked up a gourmet magazine in, sitting in front of me and it and there's this article about this mill in Perch France and this whole story of of working with the farmer Miller Baker and literally like a couple days later Ellen Scott called me from Tasmania and was like I got I, you got to get over here I'm talking to farmers I've got this mill and you're going to teach days in baking and he called Roger and, you know, I don't actually tell this story in the book because I had to leave room for like the two thirds that were a cookbook. And honestly, like there's no way I could have sold this book if I didn't have two thirds of it as a baking book. So <laughs> we get the, <laughs> but it, it, but we know about distilling story. And I did mention the article Gourmet because it was the first time that I really felt excited about something. I was sort of stepping away from baking. I had, I was actually sort of getting, um, working on a master's in writing because I, I, Peter Reinhardt had asked me to write an essay for a book that he was working on when I was baking. And I, and I was, it kind of gave me this realization that I was a little burnt out with baking because I was really excited after each bake to go and sit down and work on the writing and, and to engage with baking as a, um, an observer as well as a baker. So it kind of got me excited about that. And, Anyways, I'm telling you more than you want to hear, but the point is feeling inspired for me is a driving force. I, the bakery, starting a Days in Bakery in the early 90s, I was inspired to revive a type of baking that I felt was being lost. Um, nobody was doing natural leaven back then. And it was that same feeling when I read that article. Um, and when Alan called, I just sort of was like, I can't go to New Zealand. I can't go to to Tasmania, I said New Zealand. I can't go to, my daughter is middle school age and Rogers called me up about these North Carolina grains. So I, so, you know, grains landed at the bakery. I had Dave do a bake test. It was successful, which was incredible. And then there was a field day. And, and when I came to the field day, I mean, NC State um, Organic Grains Project was involved. So we had organic there all the bakers showed up. We had a number of bakers in the area. We all knew each other from the bread fest. So it was like, we didn't know we were all showing up. It was like, oh, there's Kathy Clue. There's, D there's Dave Workman. There's, you know, Joe Ritota. There's, you know, it was like, we were all there. Like, hey, you guys got the invite too, you know? And I got excited and wrote a grant proposal. Carolina Farms. I mean, that was our story. That's all in the book, this story of like, how did this happen? And then once it happened, what did it mean? You know, um, really shifting from kind of organizing idea to being a baker for myself and running this mill and, and really feeling like the quality of what we do has got to be the driving piece. It can't be the politics or this is, you know, the, the economics behind it, even though, you know, it was easier to get grants with this whole narrative. The reality was the baker needs a product that they can at least engage with. I mean, we were asking bakers to engage more than they would with the rolling mill product, but you know, it it needs to have certain parameters. So, like, kind of defining the parameters and figuring out. I mean, it was, there is um, 
a lot to figure out, but in the book, I'm able to kind of just say like, Hey, this is what we do. You know, like the grain comes in, this is the first thing I do. And um, it sounds really boring when I'm describing it, but it's actually, there's a lot of great story in it. And I, when I talk about noticing the bakers that came to the table, I wanted to engage deeper on that. So with this book, I identified about 20 bakers and um, some of them are old, you know, been doing it for 20 years or plus, and some of them are this new, wonderful new wave of baker. And, um, and I did profile pieces on, on them. I, I interviewed them and I drew bake, uh, um, recipes from these bakers throughout the Southeast. So there's a section with just each baker's kind of story, you know, and then the other two thirds our recipes and it's divided by the grain itself and the flour, you know? So, um, but the whole idea of really engaging on, you know, flavor, texture, you know, how are, how are the bakers using this? So if we're using, you know, whole wheat pastry flour, you know, I mean, there's plenty of bread and 99% and of it is naturally leavened and then I have one biga, um, but, um, you know, into the pastries where you're really looking to um, marry flavor with texture and, you know, thinking what, what spices or what elements are, are well matched with this flour so that we can elevate this stuff. It's not just like 1970s, there's a mill in the co-op and you can just mill your flour with a really high speed, you know, get hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cook your flour before you cook your flour. <laughs> so anyways, there's my long answer. Well, I love it. You are a beautiful writer. You really are. And to have you capturing this, um, this story of what went on to make the mill happen and then going out to, you know, present a, a chorus portrait of the bakers who are using it, that's so perfect. Um, and the recipes are great. I, and I should um, mention photography too. Rin Allen is an amazing photographer and I, I you know, was definitely honored to get to work with her. She's from Athens, Georgia, which I feel like my second growing up was in Athens because I went mm -hmm. to UGA. So it was really fun to have a little Athens in the mix. And the two of us traveled to, around mostly together to the, you know, different bakers. So we're in Nashville and Charlottesville, Virginia, and New Orleans, and down in Captiva Island, Florida, and of course the Triangle region of North Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina, and um, Atlanta, um, Georgia, and um, yeah, we went down to Mississippi. Um, so it's really, yeah, it's a really fun project in that way. It's it's so good because you know this is uh, these are regional mills. You know, a lot of times people want to translate local food to local flour, and they don't understand that for a ton of reasons, local is regional ingredients. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that that really matters that you've taken it around. Um, and the the idea the back of the book has a resources with with like I've we did our resources by region so that you could see where, where the mills are in your own region. I mean, I wasn't able to capture all of them. It was like, okay, who can we put here? Who has a, a at the time it was just kind of like, who has also websites that are easy to access so that people can get the ingredient. But the idea is to give people the tools and not feel so intimidated by working with stone ground flour, you know? Yeah. Which is, is a real, really big deal. You know, it is very different. You know, I, um, as a, as an optimist or wishful person, I always want to think like, oh, it's, this is easy. You know, you just do it, but you really don't just do it. You have to understand the differences in fresh whole grain or sifted flowers. They're very, very different. And one of the things I know that you did in the book was try to unify, um, language and volumes of language and measuring. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. You mean, um, are you talking about the sifting or about in the, in the recipes using weight versus? Oh, this, the do? sifting, the naming. Oh, oh, yeah. The, the naming. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I do feel like there's a lot of misinformation. I mean, I, I cringe every time I hear somebody say type 85 and I'm like, 
And maybe, maybe there is some type 85 that I don't know of. I do know that when we started our mail and used the term type, um, Tom Leonard, who I have a good bit of respect for, um, Browby, me. <laughs> that's a bit harsh, but he definitely was like, Jennifer, please use the language correctly because a type refers to ash and extraction is really what I was referring to as in we are measuring by extraction what is left after we have sifted out. And I do go into detail of what is the ash, the, you know, ash being a measurement of flour that is incredibly accurate to know, you know, how much mineral is left over, how whole grain this is, because, you know, once you're sifting, you're um, taking out some of those minerals. So what's left? Um, and so, you know, I, the, the language was already there. It was just that we were using it wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of get that, you know, and it's interesting because in Europe, it is, um, there is, you know, it is regulated as the European Union, but then each country has their own iteration. So, you know, like the, the range of what, you know, I, this is a hard one for me to get off the top of my head. Double O is the easiest, but double O would look different in Italy versus that same you know, there, there might be like a little higher, I thought it was really interesting looking at that, like, you know, where are the higher ash windows, because it's usually like countries that have darker breads, like Germany or something, you know, where has have kind of larger windows for the type of flower that it is, meaning that it could be, um, it could have higher ash content um, and still be considered whatever that flower is. I, if it was in front of me, I could explain this a little better but it really does um, kind of in a way speak to high extraction a little better, you know, because high extraction is like the, what's left in the flour after sifting, but it's, it's the highest amount. Like once you're sifting, it's, it's the least sifted. I mean, Baker's language is often so confusing because it's sort of like, like Baker's percentage, it's not really a percentage, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, loafing is not well. We don't actually use the word loafing, but um, but still, if we did, it's not like we're hanging out. <laughs> right. <laughs> really hard shaping and forming our loaves. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I no, that. that's okay. I think it's um, I think it speaks to the importance of how uh, the timing again on this. Yeah, book. it couldn't land at a better time because sure. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we had the opportunity to introduce so many yeah. people to fresh flour. And now you've got a tool that's going to describe the use of it and also help explain the incredible work that goes into making a mill and into making food grade grains. Yeah. And using using weight measure, I mean, I'm, I'm like, get a scale, get a scale, get a scale. We, we did provide some volume but it's all all the recipes were by weight and then the volume came from us you know doing the, i mean spoon and sweep method also put the word out to a bunch of mills to find out what is what does your cup look like you know just to kind of see you know but um but i think that the bigger point is that in america you get flour and you're really not asked to engage with it um, even though there is industry standard, it's not regulated the way that it is in Europe, but there's an industry standard of how much ash should be there in a roller mill, you know, and what that extraction kind of looks like. So it's all kind of going on behind the curtain. We just are, you know, we just get our flour. It's, it's whatever, it's all purpose flour or it's, you know, we're, yeah. It's funny there's a lot of cereal boxes out there but <laughs> you know it's like here's your choice we've made this for you but <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah which is why I love to look at old cookbooks and see what people are saying about flour yeah like the, yeah the, Bos the Boston cooking school cookbook is my current fascination and because it was first printed when roller mills and different it so refers to St. Louis flour and what to expect from that, which is yeah. uh, 
you know, a stone milled flour, but um, had some sifting and then Minneapolis flour, you know, it's got yeah, like, it's amazing. Sure. Yeah, see. I have a whole cookbook from the Rose Rose Mill, I think it's in Canada. And it was from like the 1800s, and which really inspired, was one of the inspirations for this book. Cause I was like, oh yeah, mm. like Mills used to do books. And, but then it would be like the housewife would be giving in the recipes, you know? So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get the professional bakers to give me the recipes. And I mean, we did, I did some recipes as well. Carolina Brown provided as well. But, um, but yeah, it, it was really interesting to look at the old cookbook and see the, the information that is provided that is, um, yeah, not, I mean, we have canons that say nothing about flour, but are about baking. Yeah. Yeah. It's really impressive. And, you know, and what still wasn't said, you know, like this, this uh, Boston cooking school has rye meal as an ingredient for several different, um, like muffins or gems, you know, like yeah, rye gems, meal. That's one, yeah. Like yeah. making gems and I have it in this Canadian cookbook. Yeah. It's oh really, my goodness. You gotta make gems. Do you have gem pans? I don't think so. I have exactly. Yeah. I'm not I, sure if I have them either. <laughs> I have some pans that I don't know what they are, but because I inherited a bunch of stuff that was Jacques Delangre who had started um the Celtic Sea Salt Grain and Salt Society. He that's like part of the lineage of me as a baker was like this whole um the good gray salt and he brought in Ponce's who started Ponce's bread and Chico. This is like this whole lineage of my whatever. So I inherited this like a lot of my bread pans and stuff from um because anyways so I have some things that I'm like what is this what are you we'll have to do for? a sleuthing I need to um yeah ask back the more if I'm gonna study this uh 1893 era I need to know what my gem pen gem pans actually yeah. should be yeah <laughs> but they had you know so there's there's some um knowledge and then there's some uncommon knowledge and now we have this chance to really bring people in yeah to... I know it's an interesting place because you know writing a cookbook I mean even though I collected recipes I really had to I took these recipes and made them work for the home baker and um and things that get a little tricky like I realized like I I mean, although I ran a bakery for 14 years and I had a couple of apprenticeships, so I, I learned from others, I didn't go to culinary school. So I tend to be the person like I have baking tools that I think are interesting and shapes that I like, but they are not, they're anything but standard, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and then like 12 inch tart pan, which I really think is beautiful is actually not that accessible for like most home bakers don't have a 12 inch tart pan, you know? And then, and so there's this place between not, you don't want to intimidate the home baker. Like my idea, I mean, I, my husband and I taught a workshop at, at, um, at the Fo John C. Campbell Folk School a number of years ago. And, you know, he was Flat Rock Village Bakery and I was Natural Bridge Baker and we split the week. And so we kind of, one of us was, and we had a wood fire down and one of them was supporting the other when we were teaching and I was like oh this can be like beginners it doesn't matter and we were doing milling in house natural leavening you know wood fired oven baking and I was like yeah let's just dive into this why does it matter you know so you want people to like get over the like fear and just engage but then there's this like other piece which is like okay what size pan what is the bait you know like there are certain parameters that must be met <laughs> especially in a cookbook, you know? Right, so you need to ensure success. Yeah. You have to yeah. bank on that. Yeah, and so I did, you know, have to put in that language of we're working with flour, you know, it's a live product. I mean, it, it was a lot. I mean, it's be okay with, um, with the sort of nuance of baking, you know, be okay if you, I can tell you a, a range of temperature, but like, my kitchen's different than your kitchen. My oven's different than your oven, you know? And yeah, you're in the South and I'm in the North. There we go. It's, yeah. uh, there's a lot of differences that um, create translations. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are about. Yeah. Was, um, but I really, you know, I just feel really lucky to have been able to tell my story and this story. And hopefully it's a tool for, um, you know, it, it, my hope is that it really lifts mills up nationwide that, you know, okay, we're not, because even, I mean, 10 speed is my publisher and, you know, yay for 10 speed for taking it on. And it's the kind of thing, my, my editor, Dervla Kelly, who, um, she also did BB's kitchen, which is a great book if you've seen it. And it didn't surprise me that that was hers. Cause she's going to take a project that is like kind of, um, not as mainstream. And, you know, there's plenty of big house publishing that passed on us because, where are they gonna get the ingredient? We don't know. I mean, it, it was like, it, people don't, you know, this was three years ago. I'm trying to, you know, cause the book writing takes. So um, I was really lucky to not only have a publisher that was willing to write, go with it, which is like so lovely because like Laurel's Kitchen is 10 speed and Laurel's bread book was a big, you know, Laurel is oh, like- Oh, that makes so much sense. Scott, and it's like the whole, yeah. So I love that and, um, and, that I was lucky enough to actually get to write the book that I, you know, like Dervla and I had the same, and the team at Tensby, like we all wanted the same thing, which was really, um, yeah, it was really fortunate, really fortunate. And now I get to, you know, deliver this off to the baking world. So hopefully it's very well received. <laughs> I think it shall be. It is, I wanna congratulate you and thank you for making this book and um, really it's, I don't think the timing could be better um, in terms of people needing this information. And I do think it's a gift to regional grains and will help give us momentum. So yeah, yeah. congratulations and, and thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for continuing to, you know, support all of us. You're the queen ambassador of flour. <laughs> <laughs> Not by choice, it just happens. <laughs> Great. Okay, Jen, thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Hello. Oh you know, I'm not, I just said it, you know. I'm not a big drinker. But I said, you know, so many times in that video that I think it should be a drinking game. <laughs> and if I do yeah. that drinking game, I will stop saying, you know, because <laughs> ever, because I will be so drunk that I'll never want to say, you know, again, sorry. I just had to say that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Did anybody hear anything beyond the, you know, or is it just me? <laughs> it's your tick. It, we only notice our own ticks. And know? then my dog in the background drinking, drinking. I didn't yeah. notice that at all. I didn't it's notice Bobo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So wonderful to watch that again and remember the nice connection. It's really <laughs> so fun to talk to you about this book. I, yeah. I'm going to hold up its cover again just because it's so good, Jen. It's just so good. The more time I have with it, the more happy I am. I have okay. a friend birthday coming up and like, mm, what am I going to bake? Maybe okay. the jam tart with rye crust, so maybe a Anna carrot set. cake. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There's two different carrot cakes, right? Cause we have little tart, which is a lovely one. And then Harry P. Moeller's natural leaven, naturally leavened carrot cake is in there as well. Yep. So. Yep. I'm not sure where I'm going, but I know I'm bringing your cake to the burrito <laughs> bonfire today. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we have a few questions and um, someone asked, Adrian asked oh, Adrian. if, yeah. yes, of course, Adrian's with oh, us Adrian. and she's, she's making Joe's brownies. Oh, they're su it's such a great recipe. I made those for my stepdaughter's wedding, little oh. tiny ones. And I, I used the Fossil River charcoal salt on top, which is gorgeous. Yum. I, so lovely. He is. He is. It's so nice to have his recipes in uh, your book. His bucket. recipes are so smart. Well, what a surprise because he's <laughs> so smart. Um, 
And, but Adrian is asking, do they measure the ash content of stone ground flour in Europe? They seem to label it that way, even when it's high extracted stone ground flour. Do you know about that? I mean, I, it's funny because I told my editor when I was getting, when I was getting into this part of the book that there was a whole book I could write about this in and of, of itself because you start seeing a cultural divide by the flower. But my understanding, and so that to be, that, I say that to the degree of I went only so far and there's so much further I could have gone. But my under, where I was seeing it from was let's start with whole grain and what is the ash of a whole grain before it has been sifted. So whether it is stone ground or roller milled, they, you, one can take a measure of ash and, and, you know, I just don't, and I would imagine, although I don't know that with the regulations in Europe on ash content, if you're going to call something a certain flower, it doesn't matter if it's stone ground or roller milled, it would fall. I mean, yeah, it would fall within the category of whatever that defined flower is, if that makes sense. So this would be super helpful if it was right in front of me and I should have the book right in front of me, I will get there. But in general, the higher number is gonna be higher amount of ash. So, and this is the non-combustibles, the minerals. So they're burning a sample and whatever is left is the amount of ash, which is going to be associated with that number. Does that gotcha. make sense? Because I'm sure it makes sense to Adrian, but you know, honestly, I always snooze. I, I, did you see I put the snooze button oh. on my eyes for Ash? I'm like, Ash. I no. I'm gonna do it. I know. I, I. This was when I said I know. I actually mean I know, not just like you know. But uh, <laughs> I, I think I should. I could do a TikTok if I, I, if I ever wanted to start a TikTok on on getting people's eyes to glaze over, there'd be two topics. One would be Baker's percentage and the other one would be Ash and just scare an audience to, I could do that. Or, Easily. or maybe yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it took me maybe, video. I think it took me five, six, seven, ten 10 years to like, okay, Baker's percentage. I don't have to like, you know, hold my breath and do a cannonball away from that. I, I get Baker's percentage now, but that was a long time coming and it's going to be a long time before I get to the ash long time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, there are, you know, so many things we can talk about. I'm just going to double check. Are there more questions? Uh, nope. Just getting, getting laughs, laughs. Good. That's good. We can do the flower comedy. Has it become hour. a drinking game yet? <laughs> Shabbat. <laughs> um, I am really intrigued by this jam tart with the rye crust. Like, um, let's, let's talk about any specific, uh, any specific recipes you want to, you want to discuss Jen, as far as it being something that's really teaching us about flour was, the, is there, um, Anything yeah. you can think of off the top of your head? Because I know I'm question. giving this to you blind. I know. That's a good question, though. Um, I think that one, one piece that I wish I had sort of mentioned in the writing is that, okay, so the book is organized by grain and then by flowers. So if you step back from it and see it as that sort of whole and come into, you know, from forest to trees, you'll see certain flavor elements that are falling in certain flowers. So for example, as we get into something highly sifted like our cake flour, crema flour, I'm looking at cream and citrus, whereas, you know, in the pastry world, whole wheat pastry flour is gonna look at warming spices and cardamom or cinnamon. And so I, I th and, and I had fun where I had two citrus cakes and one is a lot heartier. And the other one, is, I, I, I ran them both because I mm -hmm. wanted to show that, look, this, this one is our Trinity blend. It's a more refined flour. And 
we, there's cream in the recipe. The other one is a high extraction pastry flour and it's orange juice in the recipe, but they're both citrus cakes and they're a different approach. And so my hope is that we learn about flour in that way, that it doesn't have to be specifically you need this flour to have the freedom to choose different, like medium rye, for example. I, I'm, I love whole rye, but I'm, I'm a big fan of the medium rye because I think it so easily goes in either direction of, of, of pastry or bread. It really is happily goes either way. Whereas light rye, I'd say, you know, use it for pastry and, and save the more hearty stuff for bread. But, you know, there is places where you could, I think I said, you know, in there. Anyways, <laughs> gotta be a drinking game. Get a so, shot, Jen, get a yeah. shot. <laughs> but, um, so I did, so, th so th that's one aspect of that answer that I want people to feel free to interchange these flowers, but do it guided by a greater understanding of what will work. Like you're not going to grab whole wheat pastry and make a wedding cake with it. Right. But if you are doing, for example, um, like flat rocks, biscotti recipe, which is great recipe and that um that i found a minor mistake in by the way <laughs> if anyone has it it is two you do form two different loaves not just one and anyways i'm going to make that correction on our instagram and we'll do a demo but anyways that recipe is made with high extraction pastry flour you could do it with our ap with an ap you could do it with um in our bakery with the white wheat, but you could probably do it with the Sonoma, Sonora wheat. I, I think that you don't, not, I meant bakery, I meant mill. Um, it doesn't have to be Carolina ground specific flours. I just, I want, we used our flours in these recipes, but I want this to be a guide, a greater guide so that people can take the flours in their area. Maybe it's not an exact 75 extraction. Do it anyways. Understand how your own region works, you know? So oh, I did it again. So that's, that's my big, the big piece that I was really trying to push on the flower. The other end is I really had fun with the rye chapter and provided, I think, equal amount of bread to non So a deep dive into into using that grain, which I think is a great flagship for the local grains movement because gr rye will grow in anywhere and yeah. It's, anywhere we let it, anywhere where it's not yeah. considered a pernicious weed. Um, yeah, 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 no, it's great. I love that. I remember there were a couple of rye articles. I wrote one and then this other paper, the New, New York Times wrote a rye article right about the same time. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, rye is going to have this gigantic comeback. And it was about the same time that, um, what was the mill? Hodgkin's Mill, which was the only supermarket rye flour available on the East Coast, shut down. So here there was this, this great celebration of rye and this moment. And I've been waiting for the rye moment to happen. And I'm hoping that this cookbook with... It's, it's celebration of rye will nudge that along. You and know? Sarah, yeah, yeah. Stanley Ginsburg's book also, The Rye oh, Bay, of course. Such an excellent book. Um, yes. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll get to be together maybe with Stanley at, uh, at Asheville Bread Festival. Let's pretend it's going to happen in 22. That's, we would love to see that happen. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, it's been a, a week now that the book is in the world. Um, I'm seeing it received with incredible love and joy. Uh, are you, what's your experience of this? The bakers have been amazing. The guys from Bolted Bread were <laughs> so fun. Um, yeah, everybody just sending really warm, thankful. And I say the guys from Bolted because they did this whole Instagram, like their models and it was just funny. But everybody's <laughs> been so lovely reaching out and thanking me um, from 
you know, Dave Bauer and Tara Jensen, who are just real close people in my world to folks that I got to know through the writing of the book. And, um, and yeah, it's just been a treat to sort of put them out there in the world and shine a light on the work that they're doing. Um, those bakers that are, are featured in the book. Um, but yeah, I never thought about that, about what does it mean to put a book out into the world? And um, so it's been, it's been really a lot of warm fuzzies, not really much cold prickly, thank God. <laughs> thank God, there's enough, uh, there's enough, enough to have. haters out there, yeah. <laughs> and enough problems in the world to feel Seriously, angst Seriously, right? We don't need yeah. flower angst for the I love know, of plenty. God. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I know, I, see, and I love the Andrew Janjigian. Yeah, his piece on uh, Southern Ground and Mother Grains. That was great. That, that was great. Was. And I haven't met, it's Ro Roxanne. Roxana Julepat. Roxana. I haven't met her, but I, I want to because I love that we're both out in the world at the same time. I think very much complimenting each other. It's a really um, kismet little moment there. So, yeah. yeah. You will, you will really enjoy each other. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. Tell. It's great. There's a great um, question here from Jenny Hagland, who is a, a baker pal in the Midwest. And she says, could you talk about the number of millers, how the number of millers is evolving these days and the difficulties they face with lack of processing infrastructure and how, or if, you see infrastructure improving? Wow, well, that's a big question. Right. Um, you know, this, there I go again. This is, um, it's a challenge. It's a, we, so there used to be grain cleaners. Uh, it wasn't a big deal to have a grain cleaner in your community, seed cleaners. Farmers would get their seed cleaned. I talked to our, our seed cleaner, um, Jeff Griffin. And if you go to his area, there's Griffin Road or Griffin this or Griffin that. You can see many generations back with his family. And he tells me about what the place looked like not too long ago. There was a bunch of cleaners. We have, I think, two in the state. And then I have Foundation Seed, which is quasi-governmental, doing cleaning for us as well but the farmers convinced them to do it, which is really interesting sort of partnership between sort of the land grant and the farming end because the, the land grants do have cleaning infrastructure for foundation seed, which is the old way that seed was always put out before private agribusiness sort of took over. But um, so the reason why there's not a bunch of, of cleaners anymore is because of GMO seed. So farmers are not getting their seed cleaned to replant. Um, so, you know, here, so here we are having to rebuild that. Um, and yeah, it's hard to answer this whole question because just that one has really got it's Yeah, it's, we only it, have a couple minutes. So yeah, yeah let's yeah, just yeah. focus yeah. on cleaning because that is so big, like to well, be able for us, for example, we are not certified organic, but our farmers are. And Everything is done in an organic manner, but our cleaners are not certified, even though they purge our stuff, they treat it as it's such, but we're the only market for organic. So there's no reason for them to take on that certification. Mm -hmm. So we just say our stuff is grown on certified organic land and hold off on saying, because we don't want to spend $100,000 on cleaning infrastructure and do it ourselves because it's not what our mill is about. Um, we are about to put a bunch of money into infrastructure at the mill so that we can stop breaking our backs because that's what we're doing. Um, it's a really hard work and a lot, everything is really heavy. So there's, this is not an easy thing and this is not, we're, we're scratching the surface 10 years in. So I think that, you know, I, I think, you know, you know, I think that it's really exciting that there's a lot of mills that have come online. I really encourage bakers to, to continue to engage with mills like ours and, and, and try not to blend us down with rolling milled flour. 
try to use as much as you can because the more you use, the more you're giving back to the ability. It really so much is in the baker's hands in a lot of ways. And I mean, also the retail people at home that are buying retail online stores or in the store. I know Main Grains is in, in on the shelf and I think Hayden, but, um, but supporting these mills, all of everybody supporting them is just enables us to build these communities. But yeah, sorry, that wasn't the best answer, but it's, it's, it's not an easy answer. It's not an easy answer, but I think that you, you got at it, which is we all need to keep on communicating about what the larger goal is to get the small pieces put into place. And the more we can express, say to bakers, the necessity of celebrating, highlighting and using, focusing on these incredible, flavorful, distinct flowers, um, the more chance that mills have of getting everything that they need in line, you know, like backstream, we can get all that stuff backstream. We have bottlenecks of not having, of farmers not having storage or cleaning um, and millers not necessarily being able to afford putting in storage and cleaning. So how can we get those layers of infrastructure reinstalled? And that's only going to happen once we have more. I remember when I wrote my book, I was like, ah, I've been looking at this stuff for five years and it seems like just about the same amount of stuff is happening. And I, and I was depressed, but I didn't realize how slow it is because you have to grow all this stuff. Like one mill has to be successful. You know, Carolina yeah. Ground cannot support, you. your region cannot support another mill, right? It's it, yeah, it's really, it's tricky. I mean, it's- Well, I mean, it enough. does. You have, yeah. you have farm no, we have, yeah, but yeah, we have, re we have a few other iterations, which is great, but it's taken us, we're about to be 10 years old and we're just putting an in investment in our infrastructure. We're just moving our facility. It's still, I'm not doing silos. I'm still keeping it, the nature of what we do the same, but- we are going to store grain on site. And I just got this BQM machine, which is a CO2 hermetic seal, taking it out of the freezer, doing it this way, terrified, excited, all of it. <laughs> it just arrived yesterday. It's just, you know, but, um, so, but I never, I, up until this point, it was really scary to think about taking on the debt to make any big changes. Um, it's all been piecemeal. And they say not to do things piecemeal, but to me, it just was the safest, safest way for us to do this. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a long story. The rebuilding is a really long system. story. The yeah, is a really long story and sort of rebuilding this piece. Um, it's just, it, it, it's, it's hard to get just a, a, a snapshot of it and understand you know, there's the where we were and where we're hoping to head and, and it's all unfolding in real time. So I want it to fast forward. <laughs> I want, I want more stability and more success mm -hmm. and more mills. I want it all. So maybe with this fabulous book, <laughs> we'll get that. And we'll if anybody that. wants to, um, the, I know that there, I was just, Virginia Willis is a Southern uh, chef and she has a cookbooks with Virginia that I was just on earlier today but her Instagram is I'm sure at Virginia Willis and my Instagram at Carolina Ground she's doing a giveaway for the book right now for the next few days so if you go to her Instagram <laughs> awesome plugging that then it'll say whatever to do but if anybody wants to get in that giveaway for a book that's great. People were so excited. I got to give away some through AGC, the Northeast Yay. Grain Shed, and Flower Ambassador. So excited. So what an opportunity to Yay. get it out. And there are so many people really ready to use this in <laughs> all shapes. So I think we better wrap it up before we get into um, a long bunny hole that uh, we can't get out of time-wise, Jen. Um, thank you. And thank you. It's... Uh, just a joy to have this book. I really, really love it. 
Thank you yeah. so much, Amy. It means so much to me. And you have been such a huge contribution to this whole movement. So thank you for your book and all that you do. Of course. Of course. <laughs>
Hello and happy Grains Week Friday afternoon, everyone. We have made it to the last portion of our programming and are really excited to present it to you and to get to spend some time this afternoon with some friends across the country. So when we were putting together the schedule for Grains Week, we thought, how do we want to close out this event? And thought that one of the probably most compelling and exciting ways to do that is by offering opportunity for folks to hear from some of the amazing organizations working across the country doing grain value chain coordination. So bringing together the farmers, millers, maltsters, bakers, brewers, distillers, researchers, advocates, all the folks that make up a successful grain shed across the country. So we'll dive right in here soon, starting with our friends in New York at Grow NYC Grains and Glenwood and watch um, their videos. And then we'll go elsewhere throughout the country. So join us, keep using the chat to ask questions and really looking forward to these next couple hours with some good friends. Hello, we are going to be discussing creating a Northeast grain shed. Um, I'm with June Russell, previously from Grow NYC as the manager of Farm Inspections and Strategic Development, and now coming from Glenwood, the Center for Regional Food and Farming, as the director of regional food programs. And Julia Raggio is the business and communications manager of Grow NYC Grains. Uh, she's been with Green Market and Grow NYC for five years and has been in that role with Grow NYC Grains for about three years. So we are Grow NYC. We protect the environment, create green spaces, help people stay healthy and give them an opportunity to make a positive impact. Um, our programs focus on conservation, green space, education, and food access and agriculture. And the Green Market and Grow NYC Grains programs are under the Food Access and Agriculture branch. Green Market operates 52 farmers markets in New York City and works with 230 farmers from six states. Okay, I'm going to talk about some of the background work that we've done uh, in the big picture. Um, but it, I wanted to step back for a second and really consider this idea of a value chain. And as somebody had asked me, recently about the difference between a value chain and a supply chain. So uh, I did a little Googling figuring, you know, there's gotta be somebody from the Wall Center who's um, done a good paper on this. And sure enough, um, there was some work that was published around 2014 uh, called Food Value Chains, Creating Shared Value to Enhance Market Success, um, sponsored by USDA and the uh, Agricultural Marketing Services and the Wallace Center. Um, that really articulated a growing trend in developing value chains, kind of refer referencing organizations like Oklahoma uh, Food Cooperative and the Buy Local Movement and identifying that a value chain is uh, a food supply that is mission-oriented business proposition combining a desire to affect social or environmental change with a desire to create viable businesses. Um, they're often mission-based values that are the point of differentiation in the marketplace. Uh, with the example of green market and grow my seed, those values are within a geographic region, supportive of family farms, supportive of investment in local economies and greater potential to develop regional infrastructure. Green Market's mission is to promote regional agriculture and ensure a continuing supply of fresh local food for New Yorkers. Some of the conversations around developing a value chain for grains and flour began around 2003, 2004. There are some notes from those um, committee meetings uh, from those early days. I picked up this work in about 2007 and spent about three years 
what, doing what we would now call some asset mapping, identifying collaborators, folks in the region that were doing anything with flour, grains, uh, any research that was happening. We did about three years of convenings there internally with our bakers, sort of priming them uh, for this change in policy and also preparing them with tools and resources to integrate local products into their baked goods. Um, since this was 2009 and the, the supply was relatively small and we were really treading into unknown territory, we set our targets to be very achievable at 15%. Uh, and that went into effect in 2010. Um, we revisited that policy in 2018 and did audits on our, our bakers uh, in 2017, 2018, found that the average was 39% and raised the minimum for eligibility to 25%. Uh, in the meantime, we saw a lot of incredible innovation in terms of product developments, uh, relationships between growers and bakers, um, and the impact on the acres that that has had. Green Market has about 32 bakeries. About half of those are commercial. The other half are farm-based, meaning generally those are orchards making apple pies, uh, but quite a few commercial bakeries that have had a big impact. About 85% of this number comes from those larger commercial bakeries. Um, so with these models, we're looking at an average of about 100 to 5,000 pounds a week, big range there of business models. Uh, and the overall impact is that that supports about 300 acres a year. Uh, another important policy piece uh, was the New York State Farm Distillery Act and the Farm Brewery Act. And that overall became uh, the Craft Beverage Act that supported uh, spirits across uh, different sectors, including cider and wine. Um, those were happening about the same time and also had a big impact on uh, developing these value chains with a New York designation in particular. Uh, going into the um, um, food grade component of uh, the value chain, uh, the, an important piece of this is that the folks that we found who were working with small grains were largely organic and that most of this vision, uh, the more complex vision of supporting healthy soils, biodiversity, nutrition, transparency, resilience comes from the vision of organic agriculture. And, and there were many mentors there um, that uh, taught us uh, the importance of, of the systems approach. Um, we were participants in the first round of this project in 2011 to 2016 with partners at Cornell. We coordinated quality evaluations and sensory evaluation of uh, successful varieties that came off of those field trials during those years. We created lots of marketing and education, um, fact sheets, resources, guides, things that would hopefully inspire folks, educate them on what kinds of crops were available in the region, um, marketing fact sheet for producers so that they're looking at multiple channels. These are all available on the Grow MIC website under uh, grain slash publications. Our role has been to really supply a lot of communication across that value chain, working with those partners who do the field trials, um, also the folks who offer the technical assistance to growers and our real specialty is that market development component. It's a photo of the first grains week that we had back in 2010 at the New Amsterdam market, uh, just under the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, things that we've been engaged in, sharing information, being a matchmaker connector, uh, knowing that if a, a baker or a chef is lurking, looking to develop a certain product, that they might be the right fit for a farmer who happens to be growing those crops. Um, relationship builder, technical assistance to end users, and then also within uh, growing, growing IC inspections is a verification component of doing those baker audits uh, to make sure that everybody's in compliance with that uh, minimum requirement for eligibility. 
Uh, we've also played a role as a market catalyst and innovator working with allies to produce new products, mostly just to prime the market for inspiration. Uh, Keith Cohen developed uh, the ultimate whole wheat bread in 2009, shortly after farm ground flour came to market. Uh, in 2013, we worked with Brooklyn Brewery to develop grain market wheats, uh, help to establish some good contracts for growers uh, in an effort like that. Um, the Finnish Reese rye bread um, may have single-handedly launched a market for rye uh, back in 2011. And um, unfortunately, he's, he's not at the market anymore. Uh, and the bread is sorely missed, but it was a real phenomenon while it lasted. And uh, of course, She Wolf Bakery, who has been um, kind of an early adopter and has grown their business along with Farmer Ground Flour and being a major test baker for Greg Mull as he's learned how to be a professional miller. We also hold lots of convenings uh, from conference sessions, workshops, uh, B2Bs, uh, which is business to business events where we've pulled together producers, processors, end users, um, and really help to, to prime uh, those relationships uh, across the value chain. Um, and then our events, which are always a whole lot of fun. Um, Brewer's Choice, we've done for years with Jimmy Carbone, uh, Rye Week with the New York Distillers, uh, and the Home Bakers Meetup is a way to bring all of our uh, uh, community of home bakers together uh, to show off the amazing things that they make. Um, by 2014, uh, this was a map of our of the grain shed that was slowly emerging. Um, we stopped updating it because there started to be so many more enterprises, uh, a lot of distilleries in New York. And once we had really convinced growers to get in the game, um, we realized that there was a shortfall in terms of being a, a, a connection of, of how some of these grains were get, going to get to the consumer. They weren't to scale. Uh, some of them were new varieties that can, consumers were not familiar with, and they could not go direct to wholesale. So we performed what we'd call an intervention and set up a retail pilots at Green Market. And I'm gonna hand over to Julia and she's gonna tell you about operations. So we launched the grain stand in 2014 as the retail outlet. Previously, the farms and mills that we were working with were attending Green Markets and then no longer could for logistical reasons. So we kind of took over um, with the equipment, staffing, and expertise of Grow NYC, and also, of course, the resource of the green markets, we were able to tap into this community of people who already cared about where their food was coming from, but didn't have a lot of understanding around where grains fit into the system. So we started off at Union Square. And in the beginning, we represented eight different farms and mills, and we had 45 individual items. And this is a list of some of the products that we've carried at the grain stand, including seven varieties of wheat from the first OREI grant, 21 varieties of wheat across the region, and five varieties of barley. So we're in the forefront of the marketplace for small grains in New York City, and we're really able to tune into what consumers are baking with, what people are looking for. Um, and some of our most popular items that have emerged in the last few years include wheat, of course, specifically high performing bread flour blends and pastry flour. So in 2019, um, we moved 14,000 pounds of white and whole wheat bread flours from Small Valley Milling. And then in 2020, that number jumped to 35,000 pounds. So we saw that there is a huge, huge marketplace for, for high performing bread flours in New York City. We've also identified a niche market for specialty grains and ancient wheats like Emmer, Einkorn, and Spelt 
both with our home bakers and with green market bakers. Barley development in the last couple of years has also been significant. After speaking with Small Valley at the Hudson Valley Green School back in 2019 and explaining to them the demand that we had for hullless barley at the market, they started growing two varieties for us to sell. So a hullless black and a hullless purple barley that are now in high demand at the grandstand. People are always asking about them. So oats, also one of our top sellers, probably in the top five. Um, we basically can't keep oats stocked because there is such a high demand. We were bagging um, oats from GM Forte Farm, a farm from upstate New York, in two and four pound units, and we're easily moving 100 pounds a week at the market. There's also been a growing interest in rye, um, not only with our distillers, but also with home bakers and bakeries and a lot of people milling the whole grains as well at home. Um, we host a number of distillers every year during rye week where people can sample rye breads and rye whiskeys that are available at the market and just learn more about rye. And rye and barley are also great beginning grains for grain growers or vegetable growers looking to add grains into the rotation. There's also been a huge marketplace for beans, especially in the last couple of years. Um, people see it as an important staple of food and it's one of the products that sold out the fastest when the pandemic first hit in 2020. Um, we have been working with Vermont Bean Crafters for a while now and largely because of the demand that we've seen at the market, they have developed these new retail bags that are branded and that are now for sale at all of our locations at the grandstand. So moving back a little bit, in 2015, a year after the grandstand launched, we had some funding from Empire State Development to host a beer and spirits pop-up next to the grandstand. So we have a rotation of distilleries that will join us at the market um, and sell their local grain products. So in 2020, we hosted 26 producers on a rotating schedule at 196 markets that they would join us at next to the grain stand. Um, our distillers on average are producing 6,000 cases a year of local grain whiskeys, which translates to 100 acres of local grain each. So by October 2020 at the grain stand, we represent 16 different farms and mills and had 120 different items, crops from 95 regional farms. In 2019, we moved around 90,000 pounds of local grain, which translates to 39 acres. And in 2020, that number jumped to around 148,000 pounds of local grain, which is 66.5 acres. And this is one and two pounds at a time. Yeah, all in small retail units. Yeah. Some folks dealing in, in larger volume might not think that's much. Not, yeah. but still, <laughs> yeah. That's a cumulative of, of one pound at a time. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, so in the beginning of 2021, we moved our warehouse from a 500 square foot storage facility in Sunset Park to a warehouse in the Bronx. We have capacity now for 28 pallets. So we've more than tripled our storage capacity and have aided Grow NYC Wholesale in onboarding for new producers. And then a few weeks ago, we broke ground on the New York State Regional Food Hub, which will be a 60,000 square foot cold storage and processing facility in Hunts Point. It will have capacity to distribute 20 million pounds of food a year and support 150 local farmers supplying food for Grow NYC programs like Grow NYC Wholesale, Fresh Food Box, Farm Stand, Emergency Fresh Food Box, and Grow NYC Grains. So as we have seen, the market is a driver um, for the local grain movement and development of the grain economy. Um, it impacts the growers that we are working with and allows them to scale up and develop their businesses, 
One example being the Martins who have two farms and now two processing facilities. Um, the newly launched Seneca Grain and Bean will is a cleaning and processing and bagging facility that will allow them to get grains and beans into the New York City marketplace easier and um, just streamline that for them and for us. So these are our funding sources and um, we are still seeking full funding to continue doing this work. And these are our project websites for more information. Great. Um, okay. Um, is Are we still it? recording? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. June and Julia. <laughs> so great. Hi. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a customer, but I'll call that a big of this year, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sorry. I don't know if you're both following along on the YouTube chat, but you're getting lots of love and nice comments. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We love this work. Yeah, <laughs> any other things you wanna share? There, we, we're gonna take a few minutes between each of these presentations. It's just such an impressive body of work and so much that has inspired so many other groups and individuals throughout the country. Any like fan favorite projects or personal favorite projects that you wanna comment on? Uh, boy, that's a tough one um, because there's been, you know, it, it's been an amazing community, you know, as you see like, friendships now that are going back a decade. Um, they're, they're professional, but also personal. Um, and and I, I just think that that energy in general of, you know, that keeps building too. And as more people have uh, revelations about their food and how to connect with it and the impact that it really has, um, you know, I think spending time at the stand at the market is is always really inspiring just as much as being out in the field with the growers who are you know taking care of their end Julie, my you know? personal favorite night of the year is the home bakers meetup it's always so much fun and um you know we're seeing all these people on a weekly basis at the market, but to have them all together and be able to be talking to each other and sharing tips and favorite recipes is just, it's the best night of the year. And we had to miss it this past year, obviously because of COVID. So hopefully next year we'll come back and have just a really great night. Yep. I'm sure folks will be all the more excited for it, having had the uh, gap there. But you all have also done such an amazing job of pivoting in the COVID context and figuring it out and continuing to move, obviously, lots of grains and beans. And as we saw in some of your slides, significantly more than you'd ever moved before. So mm -hmm. it's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, and just to shout out the crew who works the grain stand have been amazing this past year and um, also really love being at the market. I remember going to see Julia at our Greenpoint McCarran Mark location on a really icy snowy day and she still had this big smile on her face. <laughs> and it's like so happy to be there. It's like it's a special breed that really, really loves being being at the markets, but it's a it's a special community also. Yeah, it's the best. Yeah, we definitely had to really pivot and kind of streamline into the staple foods and the basics. And just the volume that we were doing was 
you know, at least double what we had been doing previously. So there was a lot. And, you know, we've always had a, a very flexible model, which I think was a strength of ours at the time is that, you know, if we had to, we could do a midday run to the warehouse and pick up more product if we realized that we'd actually sold out by 10 a.m. or something, which ended up happening pretty frequently. Amazing. There's one comment in the chat that I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement, but does talk about New York farm to bakery mean anything to either of you specifically? Is there a specific program called New York farm to bakery? A farm, our first, our very first grant funding, uh, that project was called farm to bakery. Great. And that was Can you a, say a few words about that? <laughs> sure, sure. That was a FISMIP grant, which is federal state market improvements that we were on with New York State Ag and Markets and Pratt and um, um, NOFA New York. And that's what gave us funding to do our first Grains Week, which was just, you know, get some information out there and some inspiration and some fun and some cooking demos. And, um, and then there was, you know, there's a paper on our website that has the report from that project. And there was a big effort to take what was available and pair that with New York bakeries, but it was very, very early on uh, and, a, and a bit of an uphill battle. <laughs> it took another several years, I think, and still even now, you know, to, to get folks to incorporate local grains is, is still a challenge. And we have our, you know, we have our allies and we have our folks who are really committed, but, you know, there's, there's still so much more potential and so much market share that, that this could grasp. Totally. Well, maybe somebody can pull up that paper and pop it into the chat. I will. We're I'll do that. going to move further south now to the Mid-Atlantic and visit with some folks from the Common Grain Alliance. Thank you both so much for all the work you do. And we'll chat more later Thank on. You. Hi, Ben. Hey, Alyssa. How's it going? Pretty good. We are going to get your video rolling here and we'll be watching you talk a bit about what the Common Grain Alliance in the Mid-Atlantic is up to. And then we'll come back to answer any questions that came through in the YouTube chat. Sound good? Great. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers of Grains Week for um, bringing all of us together and, and getting a chance to share all the great work going around the country. Um, I'm Ben Shirovsky. I serve as a farmer education program administrator for uh, the Common Grain Alliance. And the Common Grain Alliance, very similarly to a lot of the other grain groups um, throughout the country, is really about kind of building the regional grain economy, creating a supportive environment, creating the network of, um, you know, everyone from farmers to end user uh, within the region with the goal of really um, strengthening livelihoods, strengthening local food, um, and kind of that similar conversation that I know we're all having around, you know, when you look at the local food plate, you really see that, you know, historically staple crops have been kind of left off the, the table. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations over in past years about um, fruits and veggies, more recently about meat. Um, and now we're trying to bring that same attention to the opportunity for local and regionally focused grains and create some differentiation within the market. So, um, our members span from um, Pennsylvania down to North Carolina. Um, a lot of our members are based in Virginia, um, as well as uh, members in, in Maryland. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that we're constantly aware of in our region is just the, the issues around development pressure um, that's really impacting the ability for uh, Maryland farmers and mid-Atlantic farmers to, um, you know, earn a livelihood in this, in, in farming and, and create markets for themselves that can help sustain the businesses. Um, so 
a lot of our work is uh, focused around that kind of thought process of, of what will it take to create kind of sustainable farming operations um, from both kind of the landscape side and from, you know, the economics and, and the business side as well. How can we be better supporting farmers as they try and find markets? How can we better support their operations to help um, protect them um, from, you know, crop loss or provide them with the most up-to-date knowledge around best management practices. Uh, and that's really where um, my work comes in <clears throat> with the Common Grain Alliance. Um, for the past few years, we have been working on a variety of educational efforts um, through both a uh, National Fish and Wildlife Soil Health uh, Grant, uh, which created a soil health initiative, um, of which we're a partner on, and then a Southern SARE grant through USDA, which has allowed us to build out a farmer education program. And, um, you know, initially that was all supposed to be in person, but, you know, like everyone else, Thanks to the pandemic, we've adapted, and and I think that's actually a benefit to everyone on this call nationally, um, because a lot of our resources are either available online now or will be available. Um, so uh, we, over the last few months, we've produced a variety of grain-focused webinars, um, specifically for mid-Atlantic farmers, but we'll have some applicability to others. Um, if you want to learn about protecting crops, um, want to learn about post-harvest processing and how that applies to your work, um, want to learn about how mid-Atlantic farmers are interacting with the brewing and malt industry in our region. Um, these are all, you know, webinars that we've done and are available on our website, commongrainalliance.org. Additionally, we've been producing videos on our YouTube channel uh, where you can go and find out how other farmers are um, operating, what sort of techniques they're using to harvest grains, to um, manage their, their small grains. Um, and we continue to kind of expand those resources um, and produce more and more videos. And we're really excited about this growing season. Um, and the ability to really build that out over the coming months. And then uh, finally, we're working on more local. If you're in the region and interested, um, there is a variety of field days coming up um, focused on uh, both soil health and th that marketing question. So again, kind of trying to make the case to local farmers that um, small grains are both, you know, an opportunity for them in terms of diversifying their rotation, but also a opportunity to open up new markets, high value markets, whether it's food grade, um, which is what, you know, folks, I think most of the folks on this call are probably thinking about, but also where there might be high value organic feed markets or um, other opportunities for farmers to uh, diversify their revenue streams, think about, you know, their end users and, and how they could grow their businesses that way. And then finally, with our research and or our uh, educational work, we're also working on a database of resources and tools that will be made available to the public when we launch a new website. Um, again, that's commongrainalliance.org. Um, and you can, from there, you'll be able to see uh, resources related to everything from crop selection, um, equipment choices, uh, pest and, and disease management, uh, marketing, and um, some of the most up-to-date kind of research that we can find related to soil health and, and you know, other farming techniques for small grains. So we hope that's a really useful resource, both to uh, folks within, you know, our own network and also the broader community that's on this call and, you know, everyone involved in, in building regional grain economies. 
Um, you know, I think there's a lot there that's going to be applicable to a national audience. So please uh, feel free to check that out and we can share resources. Um, we always share resources on our website as well as uh, through social media at Common Grain Alliance. Um, so feel free to reach out to us and ask any questions. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share, just in exciting updates as we continue to grow, I know everyone on this, you know, all these different groups are kind of at different stages of development. Um, the last few years, we've been operating solely on a volunteer board basis, um, just started getting kind of our first sets of grants to be able to expand our work. And in the coming weeks, um, we'll actually be hiring our first part-time executive director. Um, so we're really excited about that person coming online and you know we continue to grow the work and are looking forward to continuing to partner with the groups um, that you'll hear from today. And, and if you have you know thoughts or ideas of other ways we could be getting involved in the regional grain economy in the mid-Atlantic or, or more nationally, we want to hear from you. Uh, you know, in addition to, um, you know, the opportunity for us to expand and grow our work and all the farmer education work that we're doing, we're also beginning um, to work on some more variety selection uh, work, which I know there's been a lot of discussion about during Brains Week. Um, and, you know, that's something that in the mid-Atlantic hasn't been as prominent. Um, breeding hasn't really focused on food grade crops um, and really hasn't focused on um, the food grade crops that are really well suited to grow in the mid-Atlantic. Um, so, you know, we have issues like, you know, in some of our states, we have really hot nights. Um, so, you know, disease and, and, or sorry, pest control is often an issue um, post-harvest. So thinking about how to manage for that, um, you know, as well as just consistency and growing and, and other kind of techniques. So um, we're really excited to be a part of uh, the broader conversation in our region and the broader work going on focused on, you know, what varieties grow well in our region that have kind of markets in, in both food and feed um, where could we be helping our farming community and the, and the folks within our network continue to identify new varieties, whether it's wheat or rye or um, barley or, or a different small grain um, that really could uh, have a market opportunity here. So we are uh, excited to be beginning that work and we're looking for more partners who are interested in kind of exploring that and if you're you know a breeder in another part of the country we'd love to hear from you about your experience and, and knowledge um, and then finally I just wanted to talk or share a bit of the story about how our community has really been coming together in in the infancy of uh, you know this regional grain economy over the last few years and growing. I think, you know, everyone has had to step up and grow and change during the pandemic. And, you know, our region has been no different. And it's been really exciting to see our community come together around how to, to support businesses. Um, and notably, a few months ago, um, one of our members, Deep Roots Milling, um, which operates out of Woodson's Mill, they're a historic water powered mill um, built in, I believe, the, the late 1700s. Um, so, you know, it's one of the last operable water mills in our region, maybe nationally. Um, and it's a, a really exciting opportunity um, over the last few years. Deep Roots Milling has kind of started working out of a Woodson's Mill and, and kind of reviving the infrastructure there, this historic kind of grist mill. Um, and saying, you know, we can make it, you know, a business again. And unfortunately, um, due to the um, passage of uh, the Food Modernization Act, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, 
and uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services um, implementation of that locally, um, Deep Roots Milling over the past year has really struggled to work with them on um, overcoming some of the um, key parameters in the mill in the in the act that I think are actually kind of in in opposition to one the historic nature of the mill and to um, milling operations in itself. And this is one of those things where, you know, I think there's a lot of nuances to the, the act and, and it's a really important endeavor in a lot of ways. Um, but for one, uh, you know, the act and, and Virginia's implementation of it wanted buildings to be kind of sealed boxes more or less. Um, and I'm, I'm really kind of, you know, shorthanding for this audience. So, so uh, I'm, apologies if I mischaracterize anything. Um, and with a historic building like Woodson's Mill, uh, it it's really important for that building to be breathable, so that it can kind of you know historic building kind of um, allow it to flex and change with weather. You know, um, there's a lot there. That being said, the milling piece of their building is an entirely closed loop, sealed process. Um, and, and that's one of those scenarios where um, there was, and then the only part of that process that was um, unsealed was in the packing process. Um, and that was done actually entirely in a sealed and cleanable room that you know met the new standards. So um, the, the inspectors kind of had a hard time kind of understanding the milling operation, understanding um, how it was operating. And then the other aspect of it was the strict guidance around cleaning that's in the act and, and the implementation of it. And, and a lot of the cleaning measures can at times be counter um, to milling businesses because the last thing you want to introduce is any sort of additional moisture to the operation that can cause, um, you know, spoilage of, of flour in its own right. So um, ultimately, the, the inspectors didn't quite understand these nuances off the bat and, um, you know, wanted Deep Roots Milling to actually shut down until they were able to kind of meet these new standards, which would have might, which could have resulted in them having to actually shut down operations at Woodson's Mill um, and kind of lose this bit of history, this bit of uniqueness. Um, I'd encourage everyone to look up Woodson's Mill and Deep Roots Milling. Um, we have a video on our YouTube channel documenting their operation. It's a really unique setup. Um, and what we did as a group was we came together and, and, and put together a petition um, that received close to 2000 signatures asking the Department of Agriculture uh, to really think about this and, and look at this, the nuances here and say, you know, maybe there's opportunities um, to be, uh, to have a little bit of discretion and, and look at some of the parameters um, and work with the business so that they could stay in operation and keep this history. And very exciting to report that because of the effort of our group and, you know, getting signatures, putting together this petition and this letter to uh, the agricultural secretary in Virginia, we were able to support Deep Roots Milling in, in reopening and, and really working with the department to figure out these issues. So um, this is just a great story of where, you know, the network and the, the group that we've been able to pull together has been able to step up for each other, um, work together and really um, ensure that we're reviving this history and creating opportunities for new businesses and growing businesses to thrive. Um, and we hope to be doing more and more of that work in the in the coming years, hopefully not under those circumstances, but, um, you know, supporting our 
local and regional businesses in, in growing their operations and serving customers better and in building new markets for their work. So thanks again to the Grain Weeks folks for Grain Weeks folks for for giving this platform for all of us to share our work. And um, again, if you're interested in getting involved in any of the work that we're doing, um, our website is commongrainalliance.org. My email is ben at commongrainalliance.org, um, and you can find us on social media at Common Grain Alliance. Um, so again, thank you so much and looking forward to the Q&A portion. Ben, thank you so much for the nice presentation on what you all are up to at CGA. And I could see you were in the chat too, so you can um, see some of this commentary about Woodson's Mill and what a critical thing to be able to rally folks around keeping that mill open. I'm sure that was a really um, stressful but also neat way to pull together community. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone in our network has been trying to find ways to better support each other in these times, as I know a lot of the other groups have. And I think this was just one of, you know, a, a million different ways that folks have kind of stood up for each other and kind of been there for each other during the pandemic and during a lot of changing times as, you know, businesses try and grow. Yeah, Michelle Ajamian mentioned in the chat her peer Miller's group um, that we'll hear a little bit more about later and that they're uh, thinking about this issue. And I also just want to flag that AGC has been working this year with a team, um, a student clinician at Vermont Law School on a legal memo of how the Food Safety Modernization Act preventative controls rule applies to grain handling and processing. And we are almost to the point of being able to share um, that with others. So we'll be sure to pass it along um, to folks here in case that's useful. I don't think it will fully address the issues that Woodson's came up with around being a historic mill and the water piece of it, but it'll at least be something uh, to share with folks and that you can start with. Yeah, it's definitely, they're a unique challenge, but I, I know, Michelle, you were mentioning others are, you know, thinking about this as well. And, you know, one of the challenges that, you know, there's obviously very good intentions to the Modernization Act. Um, it's really important. Having a yes. safe supply is a good thing, for sure. Yes, but, you know, not every food business operates the same and, you know, not every kind of industry necessarily has the same, you know, parameters and considerations and just being able to kind of have guidance around those nuances, I think was really helpful. Um, you know, in Virginia, they kind of are still working through the issues and kind of, you know, they're allowing Woodson's to operate and kind of, um, you know, continue the business through kind of this period, but there is you know, a need as a group, and I think nationally, kind of all of the folks in the grain sector to kind of think about what are the nuances for our industry, um, you know, as it relates to the Modernization Act and, you know, everything going on there. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And, you know, one theme of conversation this week has been about the need for infrastructure, which is a critical piece of successful regional grain economies. But there's a lot of other kinds of technical assistance and things that come along with infrastructure, whether it's how to use equipment or the regulatory framework that surrounds that equipment use. So I think we all um, have our work cut out for us over the coming years. And it's nice to have platforms like this one to share information and knowledge. Thank you so much, Ben. It was lovely chatting with you. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can talk a little more later on this afternoon. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Emily Kayer, are you out there in the Zoomy world? There you are. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm so glad to get to introduce you. Emily is my very good pal. We get to work together a lot, which is loads of fun. And she's with the Northeast Grain Shed Alliance. And we are about to watch a fun video that they put together around one of their initiatives, the square foot calculator.
Do you want to say anything more about that before we watch? Uh, nope, I think that's a good intro. Thank you. All right, let's watch it. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for coming to Grains Week. Um, welcome to the Northeast Grain Shed corner of the Grains Week, a very heart-filled space, um, because we are going to have a little pancake check-in today. I've got Emily Kayer, my colleague in, uh, in this endeavor, and Barry Labdens, my other pal, my beer pal. And we're going to tell you all about the Northeast Grain Shed. Emily and I are chowing down on pancakes because we are working from home. I got blueberry cornmeal oh. fry. Nice. And yeah. I've got uh, raspberry, a little bit of rye, and wheat flour. So that's awesome. And, and I am hungry. No. <laughs> <laughs> because we did not get to ship Barry the pancake over with my TV. Oh well. But at least we're all here and um, we want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the Northeast. And I think the perfect, what, the reason we decided pancake was because, well, everything with me starts with pancakes. And um, pancakes are a great way to talk about a grain shed. So cornmeal rye, I choo chose these two grains today, not only because they taste good, but they tell a story about the grains that were predominant in the Northeast um, prior to our having centralized grain belts in the United States. Corn is the grain that's native to the Americas and rye is what grew well as settler colonials came in. Um, the pilgrims, their, their wheat did not do so great, but their rye mixed well with uh, corn and it was a real dominant bread type. Not necessarily pancakes, but um, brown breads. That and we still love our cornmeal rye, or at least I do, and I like to believe everybody else does. And I love them when they're from small farms that are able to direct market. That's what a grain shed is to me, where a farmer is able to directly market or sell to a, a small mill or market through a farmer's market, sell um, the stuff that they grow outside of the commodity system. and. My flowers all coming from cornmeal, uh, from farmer ground flour in Ithaca, New York. And um, they are a great cooperatively owned mill, part of our grain shed, and really part of the beginnings of grains in the Northeast in this iteration. Um, the story of grains in the Northeast, as I discovered it about 10 years ago, was a lot of really engaged people getting uh, together to make something new happen in grains. Grow NYC was starting its rule to, to ask bakers to use 15% uh, local grain. And that had been uh, after a long, careful investigation of what kinds of grains were available so that the bakers would have something to bake with and not just um, not be able to bake. So the, you know, there was there was this community inquiry going on as locavorism was happening and the there were the University of Maine, University of Vermont did their Northern New England breadbasket uh, grant and they actually traveled to Denmark and Montreal to to take a look no Denmark and Quebec to take a look at how these northern climes were were reviving grains and how we might be able to do it in the northeast. Uh, Cornell was involved, all of these small, and then the innovating businesses like Valley Malt and Maine Grains and Farmer Ground Flour really paving the way to, to get new grains onto the table because you can't get beer into, you can't get grains into beer without malting and you can't get flour into bread very easily without milling. So the central processing facilities were happening and it's uh, 
it's more and more has been happening in the Northeast. New American Stone Mills opened up in 2015, and now their mills are traveling around the world made with Vermont granite to help grind uh, flour and give farmers a reason to grow for local markets and bakers a way to mill. You know, bakers and mills are both using that. And um, that's kind of what's been happening for the last decade, 15 years in the Northeast, a really strong foundation, lots of momentum. Um, but gradually there began to be an idea that we need to do a little bit something more. Um, and Emily is uh, gonna tell us about that more and how we all came together to make the Northeast Green Shed Alliance. Yeah, so, so part of that, those foundational people that you just talked about, those organizations and, and people that laid the groundwork, um, they got together in the fall of 2019 and they sent out a survey to grain stakeholders across the Northeast saying, hey, do you guys see value in creating a regional grain system, a coordinated regional grain system? And everybody said yes. And so I think there was about 35 people that responded. And so the next step then was to say, okay, we need to coordinate. We need to increase our communication. We need to maybe create an organization that um, is like a virtual networking hub. Um, let's get together in person. Uh, and so we had a symposium in the fall of 2020 um, to get all of these stakeholders in the same place um, at the same time to brainstorm. And Amy, if you want to describe how that symposium went. Yep. And so in January 2020, right before everything began to change, we got together 250 different people from various corners of the grain chain in the Northeast, got together at Trillium Brewery in Boston. And it was a really fast paced day full of um, energy and ideas and people delivering information. So really laying down the groundwork of what we have and where we have to go. Um, a lot of the experts, Heather Darby and uh, Ellen Mallory from the University of Maine, um, they came, Mark Sorrells, I think was there, you know, so the, the incredible grain brains who are, you know, in the universities and really in investigating what kind of seeds and how to serve farmers so that they can participate in this market. They were there as well as the um, heavy hitting all stars of greens, Tor Oshner and Stefan Senders from Wide Awake, Barry and um, Ben Roche from Wormtown, Andrea Stanley from Valley Malt. Um, it was really an incredible day and part of that day, besides um, noticing our community and interest in all of this was, uh, conver you know, breakout conversations to try to think about what would be next. And then the next really suggested the, the Northeast Green Shed grant, the partnership project grant. You wanna tell about that, Em? Yeah, so, um, so basically four needs arose to the surface at the symposium. Um, the first being, we need a roadmap. We need an action plan that lets us know where we're going, where we are and how we wanna to get to where we're going. Um, we also realized we needed to bridge the gap in consumer awareness about grains being in most of their favorite products like bread and beer and spirits and granola and that those grains can be grown in the Northeast and processed in the Northeast. So consumer awareness and education. Um, the third, a gap analysis, like what do we need to have a healthy grain shed? All the parts and pieces that make that grain shed up. And then what, what research needs to be continued? So much research has already taken place. Like what can we build on so we get varieties of grain that can be grown in the Northeast climate? So uh, we got funding from the USDA, Regional Food Systems Partnership Grant to fund these four different um, project objectives. And um, things are going really well. And, you know, one of the, the, 
the highlights of this grant funding is that we're able to take off on the consumer awareness and education component um, and start looking at the tools that we have um, to start bridging that gap in consumer awareness. I know, yeah. and one of my favorite parts of that toolkit is Barry's brilliant idea, the square foot campaign. So Barry, can you tell us all about, um, I think first better tell us a little bit about your brewery, Kent Falls, and how, how it all began. Sure. Uh, so Kent Falls is in the northwest corner of Connecticut in Kent. Uh, we're on a 50 acre working farm and our farm has historically grown. We grow a little bit of hops. We've dabbled with apples and uh, we've done pasture-raised chicken and pigs and uh, pasture-raised eggs uh, as well. And we've gone to the farmer's market and you know, had both the interact it, direct farmer's market experience with our beer and our eggs and chickens. And you know, one, of, one of the actual ways that I came up with the uh, four square foot idea is through those interactions. So you know, with the chicken that's pasture-raised, the price point is gonna be very different than what you see in the supermarket, you know, a dollar ninety nine, whatever it might be a pound. And, you know, we would get a lot of people who would come and, you know, for special occasions would get the chicken, but you know, oh, it's not, you know, it's not something I can be regularly, which certainly understand, um, certainly understand and, you know, you, you try and work with and 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 talk through. And in our brewery, we've always focused on using local moth. When we opened in 2015, the supply wasn't where it is today and it was you know when we could get local malt we would make call it stylistically appropriate beers farmhouse beers and the like where it's all about working on you and our other beers our ipas and things that had larger commercial reception to it i guess you could say um were more stylistically locked into english malts or american malts and things along those lines and as we worked with our local supply chain and you know, uh, we started growing and wanting to use more local malt. The idea that, you know, the same way at our farmer's market where we want people to buy our chicken every week applies to our suppliers. You know, our suppliers who grow barley and our maltsters who malt it for us want us to use it in more than just our stylistically appropriate beers. So we really began working to find the right varieties and the right malts and what else do we have to do with the beers to build it around these grains rather than trying to just simply substitute it for uh, a commoditized uh, moth? And it was really great. And one of the ways that it that kind of reflected to me was about how much beer needs to pre be produced for a barley farm to even be viable, right? And you at some point boil that down to, okay, well, how much grain is in one beer? and how much grain is in a batch, and how much grain is in the field? Well, I didn't have the answer to that question. So working with Andrea and other you know, people to kind of get the right metric at each level, you know, the rough calculation is that one can of our IPA at 6% alcohol is about four square feet of barley field. And you know, that is something you can draw a four square foot block on the floor and stand in it. You can visualize it. You can use it in a lot of ways. And, you know, and then when you translate that to how many acres, you know, whether it's how many acres you brew or how many acres a farm needs to be, to be viable and how many beers there are in an acre, you know, you start to start getting your brain working about connecting the act of drinking this beer made with local grains and supporting the continuation and the development of small grain agriculture and the supply chain in the Northeast, you know? And that's, so that's the tool. The, the idea is, you know, how much is this thing I'm consuming? Or how much of that do I consume in a year? How much grain is that? How many people like me does it take to make this viable? And if that, if you don't think there are the number of people like you or producers like you brewing with it and all you know all the way through you know you kind of go like well i love doing this and for it to stay around i need to convince other people to do this you know so you it it puts you on a mission where don't make it your own special marketing thing that is exclusive if you want it to only be yours you either got to get a lot bigger or 
it's going to disappear because it's too hard for the people doing it if they don't have the rest of the supply chain to to back them up. So that's that's kind of where the idea uh, idea came from, uh, um, you know, and how how it's evolved, I guess, over the years. And I love how you um, you had people initially. It was right there in your tap room, right? Mm-hmm. There was four square feet, so people could really stand there and get their feet on the ground and think about it and have a conversation um, about what it's going to take. And then I also, I love that you came up with this long before um, we had the greater community conversation about what it's going to take to next step it. But you had a generous sense that you knew that it couldn't be just yours. And so automatically when there began to be, right? Yeah, it really, you know, it's, it, we've talked about local malt as long as we've been a brewery and there are people that have talked about it before us, but we really made it a thing that we were so involved in learning about and trying to figure out and pushing into our production um, through work, you know, it's not just as simple as like, well, I'll buy it local because the supply chain wasn't totally even to the point where you could do that right off the bat. Um you know, you really get to get to understand that you want to bring more people in. It is more expensive. If we have more people growing, malting, using local malt, you know, there'll always be a, a, a stratification in different malters and different prices. But, you know, collectively, we can make this more affordable for all of us, even, you know, it's uh, so, yeah, not just about local, you know, when I'm asked, why do you brew local malt? My answer though is because it tastes better, you know, and because I love the people involved in it, right? You know, it's it's a very taste-driven business, and if you're doing something that doesn't make your product taste better, you shouldn't be doing that. So, you know, I, I wholeheartedly can can back those those two, and you know, it's funny when it's such a like, I think it's something that people are trying to supply chains broke down like all of these things are really coming to the surface and the different tools to give people ways to uh understand or even know if they're drinking something local or not or eating a local loaf of bread uh or a yeah lo- local loaf of bread the the comment on our farm tours when i give when i ask this question standing on the brew house you know where does the beer start and people say in that room and you go no starts in the field with the barley and then I inevitably ask how many square feet does it take to make one beer? And I'll name one of our beers. And, you know, the guesses are all over from one to a hundred. And when I say four, the next question is inevitably, is that a lot? Mm. And, you know, people see, see barley fields. Like where do you necessarily in most areas see a barley field? So people don't know if that, you know, there's so much to connect people with, which is, you know, how far we've gotten from people knowing a miller or a baker, right? Uh, to it's a fun, it, it's frankly a fun way because you can play with it in so many numbers. You know, I, I, somebody asked you, how much beer do you brew? Well, we brewed with 45 acres of barley last year. Let's see somebody try and figure that out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, right. So, right. You know, it's that direct uh, connection the, to the ground that I think was just lacking. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, there's the, the, the visual and like tangible, uh, tangible idea of like what you're holding. I wanted to make a glass like when I first was thinking about this before any calculators that just said like you're holding four square feet of barley field, right? Just yeah. something to be able to tell somebody what they're putting in their body and, you know, supporting while they're doing it. Yeah. We actually have a a visual that I can pull up right now if you want to talk through it with the calculators so you can sure. describe. Let's see here. Um, yeah, let so, me, can you see that? <laughs> yep. <that's>, yeah. <laughs> so the calculator is kind of this, you know, it's the actual tool to take the idea and give people some answers. Um, right. So it's going to help you figure out how much space you uh, are consuming or using in any given product. Um, do you, this is this, okay. So here we go, right? So 
the inputs to the calculators that we're using are basically the amount of grain or the recipe for whether it's a loaf of bread, uh, a batch of spirit or of whiskey or a beer, right? Whatever the, the product being used is and the yields and so on and so on. And then it's kind of taking the rough uh, pounds per acre of uh, yield and then malt losses if it's being malted or losses in going through the pro different processing to get to uh, uh, the, the actual ingredient. And then it comes up with dividing by the batch size and the product to how much square feet is going to be used in each beer. So, you know, there aren't that there's variables where the different grains can change, the products can change, but you know, the, the inputs are all fairly, uh, fairly standard and it, it's up on, it is up on the grain shed website, right? Yep, there, it's not quite live yet. We have a little bit of work to do to make sure exactly. that, yeah, everything's accurate. But we do have, you know, we have the calculator for the brewers. We have one for distillers and we have one for bakers with all the inputs um, that come from the Northeast. So it's about as accurate as we can, we can get for our region. And I just want to yeah. point out that this is a loaf of 18 square feet in a loaf of bread, not a slice. So you don't have to, you know, get all heady and <laughs> yeah. you know one day this should be next to calorie count yeah yeah right? you know? yep. like how great would that be and and who knows you know it's got to start somewhere um but in terms of uh in terms of locality and and kind of starting to answer questions you know uh it helps a lot and also from from a farmer's perspective and a mobster's perspective i've talked to you know, in conversations with Andrea and I, we've all had internally, you know, if we have an acreage goal for how big the Northeast grain shed needs to be, that's really hard to think about in terms of how many brewers do you need, how many distillers and bakers, right? But when you can break it up to, all right, well, if we know it's this much acreage per barrel, all right, well, how many, what are the breweries? This brewery is this many barrels, this brewery. And when you talk about growth and committing to, you know, all right, we're going to do another, you know, our brewery is 100% local malt. So to grow is really, it's not, I can't do more within my existing production. I have to grow. And if we're close to capacity, that means building another brewery. That's a different uh, challenge than it is to find somebody who doesn't use any and get right. them to use 5%, right? right. So, yeah. you know, you have all these means it's not just like volume of beer being brewed. It's where can you get people to start using the ingredients, you know, and you can really come up with uh, strategic plans and communication with people. You know, it's probably if somebody came to me and was like, we have a goal to get a hundred acres grown and we are looking for 15 barrels from every brewery, right? That's one of our smaller tanks of beer. Um, I would commit to that eagerly. I would be like, that's so great. I would love to like be a part of this goal. We do one batch and we get it, right? And if you like it, then maybe you brew with those ingredients more, you know? Um, so the, the square footage also comes into play when you're talking about, uh, you know, getting buy-in and things like that from the consumer perspective. perspective. But I think long-term planning about what, you know, uh, people can commit to um you know who are involved in the the in using it right because that's where it's got to start with us and we have to educate the consumer if we wait for the consumer to say i demand another thousand acres of local grain yeah we'll be waiting it's gonna be time. pretty hard <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah we have to drive that demand back to the field that's what mm -hmm. this this part is about there's a general yep. awareness that local grains taste great they do something for the environment. Um, data people are still trying to quantify what that is. Um, but there's there's a general consensus that this is great stuff. But we really need to, and great stuff, and it helps out when the commodities can't. So mm -hmm. how do we make this more, more routine? How do we incorporate this, this, this food, this drink? And so that's why we have this whole campaign, the square foot is 
it's not just going to be the calculators. It's going to be a whole consumer education campaign because once people understand this kind of footprint, this kind of food print that they're, they're doing, we'll be able to get more people in involved. Um, so Emily, do you want to talk about how it, you know, the plans that we have for releasing the, the, yeah. the square foot campaign? Yeah, we're, we're trying really hard not to rush into this so that we, we have a really good campaign that's well thought through. And um, so, you know, part of this is creating tutorials so that people know how to use the calculators appropriately. And so if they decide they want to label their products with a square foot um, logo, they'll have gone through the tutorials, they'll have um, a good sense of how to use those calculators accurately. And then um, we're, we're hoping to, to get funds through a, a small grant to fund somebody that their position is to help our members walk through the process of labeling their products and um, potentially trademarking or certification marking the logo so that it has some, um, you know, it's got some, some meat on its bones. Some meat on its bones. Yeah, just yeah, like yeah. so, it can be a trustworthy and it's it's meaningful. Um, so those are sort of our next steps for for getting the process going, which also includes creating a team of people that we like this that we can um, talk through this idea more and make sure that it's 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 on the path that Barry you envisioned originally when you came up with this idea. So. Yeah, uh, this is already so far down the path from where like I envisioned it. You know, I I envisioned putting uh, Amy actually called it out a four square foot, you know, block or whatever uh, in our case for somebody to stand in. And you know, I thought I, I love I, I love I, Amy's heard this before. Uh, I thought it would get people to say, "What am I standing in?" And you're like, "That's how much barley it takes <laughs> to brew one can of beer." Instead, it uh, was too close to the bar, and it made the line form in inappropriate <laughs> places. Yeah. So this is already well past what I could have imagined, uh, and I love where it's where it's gone and where it's going. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to have helped. Uh, you know, I guess come up with it. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's super exciting to have these calculators on the horizon, and uh, yeah, you know, to be working with. Yeah, and I think, you know, in thinking of Grains Week and how there are there are groups like the Northeast Grain Shed Alliance who are doing talks like this to talk about our work and show what it can do. So I think that people are going to be peeking in and saying, what are these people doing that I can do? And I think that the the magic of our, um, our collaboration and our work is that we uh, come together with a sense of sharing and, um, and, you know, sharing and some urgency and a lot of creativity and fun. Like, how can we push this? You know, how can we get more people eating great pancakes, drinking great beer? Um, and there's, there's a lot there to, um, to share our experiences and energy to make something stronger. Yeah. Yeah. For well, sure. We, all the advocates that we can get. And that's, you know, that's one of the, the, at the symposium, it was so amazing to see people who weren't involved in the supply chain at all and just loved yeah. when they were amped about it. Right. Yeah. You know, there yeah. was some people who brought pickles because I don't do anything with grain, but I make my own pickles. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> and it, I believe in really, local food systems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really wonderful community that, you know, uh, the more outreach and the more we uh, invite people in and are, you know, welcoming and inclusive and everything, you know, the, the, it's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that about does it, although I don't think you two explained what the, the beer that you're holding, I think we should tell people about the beer before we go. Yeah. Um, so this, this was, uh, a beer called Grain Shed, uh, which we brewed with JC, another uh, founding member of the Grain Shed, um, at his brewery Trillium in uh, Canton, Mass. And the beer, it was really exciting. JC asked us to come be a part of it. 
So this beer, Grain Shed, is an American pale lager. Uh, it's exciting because it's the first beer that Trillium brewed with, uh, that's Seth, uh, with, um, with corn that he grew on his farm in Stonington, Connecticut. So wow. it's the first time they were introducing, you know, uh, something from their own ground into their beer. Uh, we use Valley Malt in it, which is the base of uh, all of our lagers and farmhouse sales and many of JC's beers as well. And it's, it's really light. Uh, it's a very dry, crisp, refreshing uh, pale lager where, you know, a little bit of the corn in the body and, and, and character, but, you know, it's not brewed to taste corny or whatnot. Uh, it's just that it's an adjunct to develop a little bit of the base of the beer. And it, we use whole cone saws in it uh, for the hops. It's really, it's super drinkable and enjoyable. And, you know, it's, it really feels like the culmination of more than just a brew day uh, with where everything was going. So we were ecstatic to be a part of it uh, and uh, hope there's more collaborations and beers like this coming out between Grain Shed members. Absolutely. I think there will be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, anything else you either you want to say? Uh, I'm super excited. There is a Grains Week, and appreciate you guys making me a part. Of it. Yeah, thank you. Toast. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Where's your pants? There you go. <laughs> They're gone. They're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, happy pancake and beer to everyone and happy Grains Week. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh boy, how fun is that? Square foot calculator. Um, Emily, are you here with us still? I am, but it says I can't start my video. Oh, now it is, okay. <laughs> Got a couple of comments in the chat of people enjoying the calculator. It's very cool. Yeah, it's fun. Ha cool. Do you have any updates on the status since you recorded that video? Um, not a lot has changed. I mean, all the calculators are done and ready to roll. Um, they've been tested and, and tried by our bakers and distillers and brewers. Um, we are still just working, having meetings, talking through next steps. Um, it's a lot more complicated. Um, then uh, then I realized at first and we really want to do a good job with it. So um, yeah, we're hoping for a fall launch, September-ish. Cool. It yeah. is an awesome, awesome tool. And I'm hopeful that there will come a time when you are interested in sharing it with other people throughout the country too. I want to use it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the whole idea is to spread the word and, and to educate folks so if we can get the calculator to a place where AGC can use it and other grain groups across the country I think that would be um, our mission so yeah that would be very cool I think it's such a unique thing you know grain can just be so difficult to contextualize and bringing it back to the you know actual land and not even talking in acres but talking in feet that the average person can understand yeah is really important yeah it's hopefully easy to grasp and and also we're really trying hard to present the message as you know you're supporting farmland right down the road from you or you know mm -hmm. you're supporting local farms by drinking that pint of beer so enjoy it a little more as you drink it because you know you're you're doing a good thing so yeah that's great how has it been the process of working on building something like that with the membership of NGA? The calculators? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was a great way for me to get to know some of the, the a lot of the researchers. So we had folks from Cornell, 
um, University of Southern Maine, um, University of Maine, UVM helping to give us the yields for all the different grain uh, that we're using in the calculator. Wheat, rye, barley, spelt, oats, and corn. Um, and then also working with the bakers and the millers and the malsters and the brewers and the distillers like, okay, well, what drop down categories do we need to make sure we have the right extraction rates or what type of milling are we doing? And so I've learned a lot and it, it took months and months and months to gather the information in order to make these calculators. Um, but they're, I think they're, they're going to work great. It's a really awesome tool and just something that's so different and so tactile. I think it's going to be so helpful. Yeah. Well, we're hoping to have them on the website and um, you have a six pack with friends and you're curious, I wonder how many square feet of farmland, you know, they can read it on the beer or, or try it out on the calculator. And um, yeah. Awesome. I love that. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing. And I want some pancakes now. Yeah, so. There's a reason why there's no, you know, you don't eat in front of a mirror. I just watched <laughs> myself eat all those pancakes. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for having us and letting us share our story. This has been really great. You guys did a lot of work with Grains Week. It's been awesome. Well, thank thanks you. for joining us. Really appreciate it. And now we're going to head to the Midwest actually, and I'm going to hand facilitation for this next set off to June. But I think if we want, Abba, do you just want to go ahead and play our video? June, if you have anything to say in advance, feel free. Yeah. I was only going to introduce you, Alyssa, the executive director of the Artisan Grain Collaborative, working out of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, with groups in the upper Midwest. Um, it's interesting to think of, you know, to, to, equate to a market like New York City, you kind of need to put together a Chicago, a Milwaukee, a Minneapolis. Just um, having a text chain about that this week, like as much as we might wish to be in some ways, we are not New York, but it's so helpful to look at the models that have worked for you all and to find out how to spin them to work for us. <laughs> all right, so with that introduction, Artisan Grain Collaborative. Hi everyone, happy Friday. This is Alyssa Hartman. I am the director of the Artisan Grain Collaborative and I am super happy to be here this, this afternoon with some of my grain pals, colleagues, co-conspirators from across the upper Midwest. So I will hand the mic to each of them to introduce themselves a bit before we get into our celebration this afternoon. We are inviting you in for a little birthday party of a new um, communications tool that we've been working on together for the past few months. So Elena, can you introduce yourself? Hey everyone, my name is Elena Byrne. I am lucky enough to work for two great organizations, the Artisan Grain Collaborative and also Renewing the Countryside, which is a Minnesota-based nonprofit. And I help with communications. So um, I've been very involved in this infographic and we're really excited to share it. Thanks, Elena. Claire? Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Claire. I'm the maker, baker, and founder of Tefola, which is a Tef granola. And our Tef is grown on our seventh generation family farm, where we are pivoting from corn and soybeans to alternative grains and seeds. And I am so excited to walk through this graphic with you. It's going to be awesome. Did and you lose Alyssa? <laughs> I think we did. And Ben, why don't you introduce yourself now? Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> it was me. Okay. <laughs> oh, hi. My name is Ben Penner, and I'm thrilled to be here today uh, and find all of you. Um, I am an organic grain farmer in the southern Minnesota, St. Peter, Minnesota. And I grow wheat, um, rye, Kernza, which is a new crop developed by the Land Institute and the Forever Green Initiative at the University of Minnesota. 
and I have a line of uh, organic uh, whole grain and all-purpose wheat flours um, in stores around the state of Minnesota. Also the vice president of the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative, and we're trying to develop markets for uh, climate-friendly crops like Kernza and uh, Pennycress and Winter Camelina uh, to develop the supply chains that go into those um, getting those crops out to market. I think that uh, the collaboration we've done on this new um, uh, infographic is going to help us really get the word out. So glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Jenny. All right. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm a baker out of Michigan at Bird Dog Baking. Um, and we are new on the scene. We focus on using all regional grains. So we are able to source 100% regional flour for our breads, which is pretty rare, um, but very lucky to live in this region that it is grown close by. Um, and just kind of focusing on the environmental impacts, but also making it uh, friendly and comfortable enough for the consumer to still buy our products. So. Excellent. Thank you so much. So here today are just a smattering of our approximately, I think last I checked, we're up to 140 members, the Artisan Grain Collaborative, of folks working across the grain value chain throughout the Midwest. And we're really lucky to have pretty much everybody in the room in terms of the different aspects of work in the grain value chain. We've got an amazing group of farmers, processors, end users, and folks that work in more of an advocacy role, whether that's around research or storytelling, um, other components to really build a robust community-based regional grain economy um, in this part of the country. And we're so glad to have this amazing group of people. I have been in my role with AGC since August, 2019. And shortly after coming on board, something that came up um, very early on that was very obvious is that, and this will not be a surprise probably to many listeners of this call who are engaged in grain work in some way or another, it's a little tricky to talk to people about grain <laughs> and what it is that we're doing. We use a lot of terminology like artisan grains or regional grains that might not be completely familiar to people. And I think for a lot of folks, because of the way commodity grain systems have developed, there's a sort of intentional invisibility in place about how grains move from a farm to a box of packaged food that you might be eating. And so there's a lot of illumination that is needed to make what we're all doing here, getting grains grown locally, processed locally and into local people's hands, um, we need to help people understand that story and what is happening and the hands that the product is moving through to get eventually to people's plates and glasses. And so we together knew that we wanted to make something to help serve that purpose of illustrating to the public um, what this grain value chain is, what we mean when we talk about our regional grain shed. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Elena to talk a little bit about the process of how we came up with the thing that we have um, now, as of yesterday, happy birthday, grain value chain illustration. And please check out our social channel. We're at Artisan Grain Collab, and you'll be able to see all these lovely, beautiful zoomed in tiles that our incredible designer, um, Amy Sparks from A Visual Spark in Minneapolis put together for us. But Elena, I'll pass it over to you and I'm going to share on my screen um, what we're talking about here while you chat. Sounds good. So we initially leaned a lot on some of the graphics that were already available. One of those being a, a grain chain infographic from Mona Esposito in Colorado. Um, we used that, for example, when AGC and Renewing the Countryside together presented a, a regional grain exposition at the Minnesota State Fair in 2019. Um, and we had leaned on that some other times and were really inspired by that and wanted to convert it to something that was representative of 
our members in our specific region um, and call out specifically um, all of the people doing such great work and what we mean by grain chain um, and, and to be able to illustrate that um, so that it was engaging with the public. And we worked with an amazing uh, graphic recording artist um, named Amy Sparks, who um, has a business called A Visual Spark and has done graphic recording for events such as the Moses um, Organic Conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, she's Minnesota based. She had also done graphic recording for the Food Ag Ideas Week in October of 2019, and that's when Alyssa actually met her. And that is when the, um, the first nuggets were started of, of creating this. And I looked back and our Google Doc for drafting text um, was opened and created in October of um, 2020. And this has gone through different iterations and Amy Sparks ha has come up with um, a variety of ideas. And this was the one that, that we collaboratively worked into reality. And she was extremely patient with us um, because it was a, a process where we engaged with our members a lot to um, get their input and make sure that this was something that represented them well and that they felt was a good starting point to be able to talk to customers. Awesome, thank you, Elena. So with that, I'd love if each of you, Claire, Ben, and Jenny, could kind of chime in and offer some thoughts on why you think a resource like this will be helpful for your own farms and businesses um, and how you think you might use this. Part of what we hoped um, when we made this, and again, drawing inspiration from uh, Mona Esposito's Colorado Grain Chain graphic, as well as some others that exist out in the world. There's a great one that Grist has created of artisan and commodity bread production. Um, Deer Creek Malt House has a series of illustrations that they made as part of the Philly Grain and Malt Symposium a few years ago. And then one of our own members um, in Wisconsin, Madison Sourdough, also has some really pretty illustrations that they use to talk about the farmer Miller Baker connection. And we really wanted to make something that built upon those things was more specific to our network and members, Elena, as you said, and also something that was super functional. So our goal is that this can be chopped up as we did yesterday for social, that it can be printed really big to be used in um, in-person spaces, that it could be made um, smaller and used potentially on the shelf of a co-op along with product to be able to showcase um, what you're buying into the system that you're stepping into when you purchase local grain. Um, so just that's a few things to get all of your minds rolling. So Claire, why don't you start? Why do you think something like this matters? How is it gonna be useful to you? And how do you think you might use it? And you can feel free to share your very enterprising, sticky idea for how you might use it, even though we haven't actually done that yet. <laughs> it will happen. Um, I think this is so cool to show consumers that what they might be eating or drinking is just part of something so much bigger. Um, and I think partially everyone wants to be a part of something bigger just to feel um, important and all that kind of thing. I think it's so cool to visually see the chains of how things get from farm to table. I mean, everyone knows like, oh, farm to table, and they think like restaurants with gardens in their backyard. But really, in the grain world, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but this really simplifies it and shows it shows the steps. Um, I think it's I think it's amazing. So um, I also like seeing that everyone is represented, especially with the AGC with the wide um, like range of different types of members, like everyone can point to a part on this chain and say like, oh, that's where I fit in, which I really appreciate. Um, so how we're gonna be using this, uh, we wanna put it on the back of our postcards, which we include in every online order. We would take it to farmers markets and festivals to be able to start a conversation about what grain is, what the grain chain is, why grains are important, why they're healthy for you. 
And then um, Alyssa mentioned this, but we want to print the um, the actual chain, the colors there onto packaging tape and use it on the outside of our package boxes for our online orders. Um, just to, I don't know, just like really get people asking questions and reading it and wondering where their food is coming from and how many different people were part of getting them their food. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. I am excited to order packing tape. My friends and family are going to be very confused about why everything I mail from now on is going packing to be Packing tape covered. is so much fun. It's the best. It's going to be great. All right, Ben, you're up. Why do you think this is useful and how are you going to use it for your farm and the other um, businesses that you're involved with? Yeah, Alyssa, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, what we're involved with here as a group um, and as a society, this is some of the most uh, important work really in the world right now. Um, and that is, you know, our response to climate change and how, how we, um, you know, in our agricultural systems really look to move towards, uh, towards that a, a system that is uh, responsive to those challenges. So what I plan to do with uh, with the infographic. I mean, I think it really shrinks down and uh, illustrates the uh, both the complexity, but also the um, uh, places where people can can um, imagine themselves within this grain chain, and even imagine how they themselves, whether it be a farmer, whether it be a you know buyer, grocery buyer, or you know uh, someone delivering a package with packing tape, how they can uh, um, improve on on each one of those systems. So I think it gives gives us all just a, a new tool that will help accelerate uh, that process forward. What I plan to, to do with it, I, I love the packing tape idea. I think I'm going to order some of that if it comes to fruition. <clears throat> and um, I have on my uh, product list, uh, I sell to re retail stores, and I think that it would work really well as a shelf talker, um, kind of right alongside even a recipe card or something like that to really tell the story. And as someone is walking through a food co-op or their local grocery store, uh, tells the story, it really calls out to them. Uh, they can have a look at it and have a moment with it and say, well, you know, this set of products works well with what I value because I can see that they've uh, discussed it on this infographic. So I think there's, that's that's really a, a one of the primary ways that I, I plan uh, to use it. Of course, you know, sharing it on social media, I think um, uh, is going to be kind of an important channel to get the word out about what we're all trying to do. Um, and I think that there's such a need right now for building infrastructure not that we've forgotten about the infrastructure, but to sort of reimagine it, that um, this, this tool will help anyone who has agency to find ways in their own networks and their own lives to help build those networks. Awesome, thank you, Ben. I think that was really useful to think about. And I also am hopeful of how this can be used in the sort of grocery type setting, because with grain, when you're not purchasing from a farmer's market or a direct transaction with a farmer, that ability to tell this sort of complicated story about why this is different than a cucumber is sort of lost. And so hopefully this can provide sort of the role. It's not the same as a human interaction, obviously, but it can kind of act on all of our behalves in all of those situations where people are purchasing in a, a space where there isn't going to be a human um, to provide that storytelling. And I can imagine it also um, adding to a conversation that you might have, for example, at a farmer's market or like I experienced at a product, uh, I mean, sorry, a store launch the other day where uh, people have, have questions and sometimes they're not uh, sure if they should ask them, but if you have an infographic that prompts those kind of questions and that kind of conversation, uh, there's um, uh, quite a few conversations contained right, right here in this infographic. I agree.
Um, thanks, Ben. I think you're calling. Why do you think? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, this thing is great. Um, I think me being kind of on the end user side on the baker, I'm removed physically from the fields. And so communicating to our customers, just the immense efforts that go into processing grain, growing grain, doing grain research and all of that. It's, um, it's easier to not think about that when you're, you're on the con uh, consumer side, just getting a loaf of bread. And so this is really a great way to, um, again, make them understand why grain is different than a farm to table tomato or strawberry, that sort of thing, and have them see every single step uh, of the chain. And like Ben was saying, to, to rethink how we can strengthen the infrastructure of all of these um, stages that have been kind of lost, um, like you were talking about the mill that was kind of put out of commission because of food laws and that sort of thing. And if you have people reading this graphic and saying, oh my gosh, grain has to go to a mill. I never even thought about that. You're gonna get more people jumping on board to save mills like that and just advocates all across the board that are gonna be interested. Um, I think having people be able to look at all the stages and Claire touched on this too. People really want to do the right thing. People want to eat locally. People want to source responsibly. Um, and so kind of putting this graphic in their face and saying, hey, look what you're doing when you're buying this. It's a really big motivator for them. And they kind of have a story that goes along with it, which is just, you know, pushing them more towards um, buying from that system and getting their friends to and shouting it online and all of those things and really being advocates for it. Um, in the public world where you don't have to go to a grain meetup to to like hear all of these phrases. It's, it's I think, very helpful in um, educating the public about the difference between regional grain and commodity grain and the benefits of that um, in a really easy to read, fun and super packed little card. So the thing for us is that we're gonna try and scale it to like half sheet paper size and just force it on everybody. So we'll be um, sticking it in all of our bread bags in the stores and in the um, farmer's markets and that sort of thing. You can't even like begin to, to share all of this information with someone just in a conversation. So, you know, getting it into their homes, having them like pick it up and see it and then they'll have time on their own to read it and kind of get into it is um, gonna be really useful. So I'm excited about that. That's great, thank you. Well, happy birthday, <laughs> Grain Value Chain. We're so glad that this thing finally exists. It was a real group right. effort and took a good uh, chunk of time to make it. Things always take longer than you think they're going to when you're doing them together, but that always means you end up with a better product in the end. So thank you three for your time today and also for your contributions in making this thing to begin with. Thank you, Elena and the rest of the AGC team for your work and to all of our members and partners that provide comment and review, so very helpful. Um, and do check out, I put in the chat of the live YouTube, the um, social handles for all of these folks so you can follow along with their work. And stay tuned because later this month, we are going to be um, launching a whole new website uh, over at AGC, which will include this illustration, along with lots of other great resources for how folks can um, more fully step into the grain chain, both here in the Midwest and in your respective region. So thank you all. Any parting words from anybody? Yay, grains. Yay, grains. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you grains week <laughs> yeah great all right take care everybody thank you bye-bye hello and welcome everyone my name is abba kaiser with the wsu food systems program and i'm joined here today by michelle ajamian of shagbark seed and mill as well as the appalachian staple foods collaborative 
and they're going to talk to you a little bit today about their work and the amazing newsletter that they compile with their team uh, that comes out quarterly, which you should definitely sign up for. It has lots of compelling content and a way to touch base with a lot of the national collaboratives that are working towards regional seed economies and regional grain economies. Uh, so with that, I will let Michelle take it away and share a little bit more about their newsletter here. All right, well, thank you, Abba. Um, yeah, I think it would be great to just use the most current newsletter as my talking points uh, about the Appalachian Staple Foods Collaborative. But before I do that, I wanna give you a little bit of background. Um, we started the Staple Foods Collaborative back in 2008. Um, and when I say we, that was my partner and I, Brandon Jaker, who subsequently, both of us subsequently went on to start Shagbark Seed and Mill um, through a process of trying to assess what's needed to develop regional staple food systems. Um, and that grew out of uh, what we like to say, what we like to call existential anxiety. Um, <laughs> because we were traveling around and doing our own gardening and stuff and realizing that there was this great local foods movement burgeoning all over the country, but there were no local grains, there were no local beans. And we ate a lot of both of those and we started digging in to find out where the heck those things came from. Ah, so we were a little bit dismayed to find out our beans were coming from China, for example. Um, so that got us started. And um, in this latest issue of the newsletter, there is a little blurb about the work that we've been doing and tells a bit about that. There's a lot more on the Shagbark website. Um, so we embarked uh, to get some help from uh, the SAIR program, that's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education to test high nutrition grain and bean crops. So we did that in 2009 and 2010 with a farmer rancher grant. Back then they were $5,800. And um, we worked on four farms and did test plots. And to our shock and amazement, people started calling us from around the country. I mean, people found out about what we were doing and asking to buy the crops we were growing. And we were doing test plots. So we couldn't sell the plots we were growing, the crops we were growing. So um, we upgraded our grant with um, SARE and we decided to do market size plots so we could actually test the market with what was growing. Um, we initially started out with things like quinoa, amaranth, adzuki beans. Um, we even grew a little bit of garbanzo beans. I mean, this is Appalachia, so many of these things aren't what people grow down here or even in Ohio for that matter. Um, spelt, heirloom corn, buckwheat, millet. I think I mentioned millet already. So we grew a lot of unusual crops and we got our ideas essentially from the World Health Organization that named um, a number of crops, particularly amaranth and millet as crops that were kind of climate ready. They're, they're very high nutrition and they do well in drought. Um, so we wanted to test those out. And later, um, we were still, uh, you know, we still had our head in the clouds, I want to say, because we thought we were going to figure out what grows and grow them for our community. And we knew absolutely nothing. We had both had veggie farm backgrounds, but we knew nothing about um, the fact that when you grow these particular crops, you don't just go out and pick them and eat them. <laughs> they have to go to seed cleaners. They have to go, they have to be processed, right? So um, that led us to, I mean, before we knew that, we were still kind of ignorant and just enjoying ourselves with our little clipboards and pencils behind our ears. Um, <laughs> we, we applied for a small grant to do an assessment of what it would take to build a regional food system around staple foods. And out of that grant, which was, I think, 2010, we came to the conclusion that, guess what? Anybody who looks around would know this, but guess what? 
all the mills disappeared 60 years ago. And we need to have a mill in order to encourage any farmer to grow any of these crops. So um, we launched Shagbark Seed and Mill and that was in 2010. So we've been operating Shagbark for 12 years now. And um, about a year ago, um, Rural Action got back involved. And I wanna say back involved because back at the beginning when we applied for those for that grant to do that assessment, we needed a fiscal sponsor and Rural Action stepped up and was our fiscal sponsor. So we could apply through a nonprofit. <coughs> and, um, but a year ago, we actually um, brought the Staple Foods Collaborative to the Sustainable Agriculture Program at Rural Action, which has really helped us uh, uh, gain momentum that we weren't gaining um, with that as an entity. We've been more focused on keeping the mill running and figuring out how to work with farmers and price points and branding and um, distributors and all those things that many of you who are farming or milling or uh, maybe even brewing, you're very familiar that a lot of your day-to-day -day is really focused on how do you sell what you're making and how do you keep the integrity and identity preservation of your product? And that's been, that's been it for us for 12 years now, I think, and, 11 um, years. So just to clarify for folks on the call, because there yeah. are many organizations at play here. Yeah. It's, it's Shagbark Seed and Mill is your business that you have that provides, you know, regionally adapted seed and pulse and food uh, mm -hmm. for folks. And then um, Rural Action is the fiscal sponsor of the Appalachian Staple Foods Collaborative. Is that correct? Well, that was its role 10 years ago, but now the Staple Foods Collaborative is actually part of the Sustainable Agriculture Program at Rural Action. So we are woven <laughs> into the fabric of the organization. Okay. I mean, it's like, I need a flow chart. Don't so you? you're, you are, you are within <laughs> Rural Action as the Appalachian Staple Foods Collaborative. Yes. You also yes, and have I, shag bark seed and mill on the side where you provide amazing food for people. So I just wanted to clarify that for folks yes. who are trying to track that flow chart in their minds. And yeah, um, it might help to get into some of the work that you have on this newsletter. Um, we've got about 12 yes. minutes left in our call here. Oh yeah, no problem. So um, we're really excited about this newsletter because we, so this newsletter, we do two newsletters, and this one is the one that reaches out and networks around the whole continent. What's happening in North America around staple food crops? And this one has a focus on the borderlands, um, the Southwest, uh, you know, where it meets the border, the current border. <laughs> so I'm really excited about this because um, Gary Paul Nabhan, who is a wonderful inspiration to me, has written this first article writing about what is happening in his watershed and what's happening between where he lives, which is about 30 or 40 miles from the border and across the border um, with indigenous people and the history of their incredible knowledge and much of the food we get is from that knowledge. Um, so that's really wonderful. And then also um, I was turned on to this woman named Lily Roby, who, not Lily Roby, but um, Leslie Skykes, Lily wrote this article about primary beans. And that's a new business down in the Tucson area. And um, Leslie used to work for Red Tomato up in the Northeast. And she left there and she and her sister have started this wonderful business to get beans out there to people. So I encourage you all to look at that. And then um, Leanne Hill, who just became the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance um, wrote this piece. She has been involved with Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance for some years doing trials and working directly with growers. 
And what's really interesting about what they're doing is they have 250 varieties of grain and alternative grains, and they're offering to people all over the country to volunteer to grow these out. And one of the things that is a real bottleneck in this food system is that there are a number of important and treasured um, heritage, land race, grain, beans, et cetera. But the only way you can get them is in little packets that you could put in your garden, which is wonderful. But if I, for example, as, a, as an owner of a mill, want to bring in um, a couple of thousand pounds of a certain kind of bean, there isn't enough seed out there. So we need to figure out how to scale up the seed um, bank, if, it, if you will, you know, so that farmers who are ready to put in 5, 10, 20, 30 acres of a particular variety can do that. So I think their work is really critical, to, a critical step towards that. We also, in every um, issue, do policy briefs. And um, last time we did an update about um, Biden's, uh, mm, the whole budget for agriculture and at-risk farmers. So we just wanted to do a little update about what was happening there because he has an infrastructure proposal on the floor. And, and then another volunteer, uh, Jesse Swisher, did this great article on the UN Food System Summit and the controversy around the summit. So those of you who subscribe can read all of this later. This is, uh, we haven't actually set this out yet. So this is like my draft. So let me talk about neighbor loaves. I know I have a few minutes left. Um, this is the stuff that the Staple Foods Collaborative does aside from um, this newsletter. Um, we have launched a neighbor loaves and meals program, which was inspired by um, the Artisan Grain Collaborative's neighbor loaves program. And we started it back in June or July, and we've sold um, 1,400 loaves of bread to food access programs to date. And we've just brought in another bakery, that, that's from one bakery, another bakery of um, two restaurants and a grocery deli. And they're all making ready to eat food that is gonna to go to food access and they sell that food on their website and you can go and buy it. Anybody can buy it. You don't have to be in our community. If you feel generous and wanna buy some, buy some because you won't get it. You're paying for it and that food is gonna to go to food access. Um, we also convene a Miller's peer group that meets once a month um, on Zoom and we have 53 members from around the country. And we are talking about all kinds of things. So we typically start with a tour of one of the mills and then we talk, you know, and it's, it's not my, it's really wonderful because many of the things I convene, I'm like setting an agenda and a program, but really what I'm doing is creating a vessel, a container in which millers can talk to each other and find out what they need. Um, and this is a bit more about Shagmark Seed and Mill because we, um, are supporting my business Shagbark um, in a local food promotion program planning grant. And we're in the middle of that plan to look at how to really meet our vision of being a model for regional staple foods. And finally, um, we convene the North American Staples Network, which is an informal network, App is part of it. And there are about 12 members or partners, I'd like to say. Um, and we get on a Zoom call about every quarter now and talk shop and support one another. And a lot of partnerships have grown out of that, which is very encouraging because we really need to work across regions, right? Like if every region does a good job and we're not connected to one another, we really aren't going to compete with big ag. And, and finally, we just put a lot of great links in our newsletters for more reading, more listening, more watching. Etc. And uh, and there's Greens Week <laughs> on our calendar. So um, I think that's it. I think that's it. If I I might have left something out, but talking fast and trying to get it all in. That's super exciting, Michelle. I cannot believe how much work 
you and your team put into this newsletter and um, more people should know about it. And there is a sign up form that we're going to post the link to in the chat for the newsletter where you can get all this incredible content um, and find out about all these groups that are forming kind of organically across the country. And if you want to get involved, there are, there are um, points of entry there. And you're absolutely right about uh, breaking down the silos and connecting across um, space and time. And, you know, COVID has given us the opportunity to, I mean, you know, there are obviously so many challenges, um, but to really uh, recontextualize place and mm -hmm. um, to uh, connect with uh, people who are doing uh, similar work across the nation. So it's just been um, really inspiring to see it all come together in your newsletter like this as well is, is in incredible. So thank you for all the work that you do to put this together and to put it, put it out there. Um, and where can people sign up? Well, um, you can go to the Rural Action website. Um, Abba's going to put a link in the chat. And if you click on that link, it's going to bring you to the place to sign up for this newsletter. And I didn't mention, but I will real quickly, we do another newsletter for um, the Appalachian region called the Hopewell Quarterly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I think we'll make a little more time for Q&A here and stop the okay. video. Okay. All Thank right. You so Thank much. you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Hi, Michelle. Hey. So I nice. love the artwork for the Grains Week. I just think that is so gorgeous. It is good, isn't it? Kate it's... did a really good job with it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, I have so enjoyed receiving your newsletters, and I'm glad um, that you had some time to walk through this last one. There was so much good content in there. Yeah, it's been fun to do it. I, I really enjoy uh, putting it together. And I have a great team of interns and volunteers who work with me. So I'm not doing it all by myself, which is good. That makes a big, big difference. Yeah. <laughs> I feel the same about the newsletters that we do. Right. Yeah. And we're lucky in the Midwest to have you as part of Shagbark Seed and Mill within the Artisan Grain Collaborative community too. So there's lots of good mutuality between our work. Yeah, I'm really excited about that graphic. I'm yes. like, I've already done a search for a customizing packing tape. <laughs> <laughs> good, yeah. People were talking about also those Swedish dish cloths. Do you know what I mean? The ones that are like all scrunched up and you get them wet and you sort of use them as a sponge. Oh, you okay. Sometimes see them at co-ops with different things printed on them. So we thought those could be cool. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Well, Hi, June. Hi, Michelle. How's your, <laughs> how is it? Great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. You also listen, yeah. Arts and Grain Collaborative. So amazing to see all the work that's happening now across the country. Yeah, I really love that um, square foot mile or square foot grain thing that Northeast is doing. I, I uh, We wrote an article about that last year before it unrolled. And now I'm excited about like, how can everybody in the country use that? <laughs> Seems like a good idea. Definitely. It's a, uh, definitely a good tool to connect folks to the impact that they have and um, it's definitely an important, important tool to have. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, um, and also a list of the graphics that you guys have done. It's super helpful and really uh, demonstrating all of the components and where folks find their place. Um, is there, uh, you wanna tell us about any, any other projects that you're excited about? Well, one thing on our end that I had no idea how much time it was going to take is that uh, we are launching a new website this month, which has a lot of different resources in it, including a grains 101 section, 
that goes through 16 different grains that can be grown in the Midwest and provides information about their history, their domestication, how to use them, their, their different functions, um, why they are important in crop rotations. And that has just been such a useful um, process to pull together. And I'm really excited to have that, to be able to share with folks across the country. I hope it'll be helpful, not just for our region. I mean, you know, the great thing about working with you, June, and others in the Northeast is the Midwest, the upper Midwest, especially, we have really similar climates in a lot of ways as um, mm -hmm. your region does too. So I think there's just a lot of opportunity for shared resources from the Midwest and Northeast in particular. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, different, different challenges. Sometimes I'm, you know, amazed at the land, Matt, you know, have much bigger farms out there than, than we yes. have here. Um, but we kind of have opposite scenarios. We have small farms in a big giant market. You guys have big farms, smaller markets. To yep. Yeah, so it's- yeah. Um, yeah, and then yeah, also in Appalachia, Michelle, it's um, what are what are your the main markets that you sell into? And in? well, for for shag bark, our primary market is Columbus, Ohio, and around Ohio. So we have branded pretty tightly to uh, serve our our close in region. However, we recently expanded out into the Mid Atlantic region through Whole Foods. Um, but that was just with our beans and popcorn and chips, not with our flowers, because we're still struggling with this whole question about fresh flour, right? So when you sell your flour to a retailer, at, we don't know how long it's sitting in a warehouse, what the temperature is. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a different place. Something that I'm excited about is I, I just went down to Woodson Mills um, which was mentioned by the Common Grain Alliance. And on the way back, so that was amazing because that mill was built in 1794 and they're operating that mill and they've got some modern equipment in there, but it's mostly like all the old stuff. And, um, you know, it's kind of exciting to see a group of younger people take over an old mill. And I, I got to meet the grandson of Woodson, who ran the mill way back when he, you know, he's an old guy now, the grandson is, and, and that was kind of fun. But on the way back, I, I visited a couple of people who are involved in nut production. And that's what I'm pretty excited about for the Appalachian region in Athens County. Um, some colleagues of mine have planted a couple of thousand chestnut trees in the last few years. And we've you know, I've gotten to go to those plantings. And, and then I went in West Virginia to visit Bill Whipple, who was doing acorn flour and pressing acorn oil and hickory nut oil. And I think, you know, this, this part of the world wants to be a forest, right? So yeah. let's look at, <laughs> let's look at how we can eat from the forest and how we can, um, actually do something right in terms of the soil and the climate. So I, I'm kind of excited about exploring that whole piece of yeah. staple foods. Yeah. That, that's the next decade, right? <laughs> when, oh yeah. Well, oh boy, yes. Another long term. Okay. I'm getting the sign from ABBA. Um, thank you both. And yeah. we will move on to the West Coast. And thanks, June. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Take yeah. care. All right. Hi, everyone. Abba here. Thank you so much, Michelle and Alyssa and June um, for that presentation. We're going to just keep rolling right through these updates. And I want to welcome a, a friend of mine and a collaborator, uh, Mercy Karyuka McGee. How are you, Mercy? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Amber? How is I missed, I missed you today. <laughs> I know today I didn't tune in because I was doing some bamboo hunting, but oh, then the rain was too much <laughs> for trios, so we can put our our, our um, peas and 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 uh, beans up. So yeah. yeah, so I didn't tune in this morning, but I was looking forward to this opportunity mm -hmm. here. So I like the previous um, 
um, uh, presentation was pretty interesting. So thank you for bringing that to the platform. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're going to watch a video now that is, uh, there are two videos that are uh, our West Coast updates. So we're going to hear from a farmer um, who's unable to join us today, um, but their name is Mai Nguyen. And many of you know Mai, um, but we're going to hear a little bit of an update from her in California. And then we're going to go to our pre recorded video. Um, and then we'll come back for Q&A and feel free to post in the chat as you go. And then after our Q&A at the end, we'll have a bunch of people join the Zoom room and we'll all raise a glass to the event. So we hope that you guys can stick around for that. But for now, let's turn off our videos and our audios and we'll play um, these West Coast updates. Thank you so much for joining us for this last hour of Grains Week. Welcome everyone. My name is Abba Kaiser and I am the project manager for the WSC Food Systems Program and the Cascadia Grains Initiative. And I'm here talking today with farmer Mai. Hello, Mai. Hello. Thanks so much for having this conversation with me. Uh, Abba and I were just talking about how this past year in particular has been so full and there are so many things that I can talk about. And so we um, thought about making this a conversation where then Abba could ask sort of particular questions that might be of interest to a broader audience. And I can provide insights about what it's been like as a farmer and trying to feed my community, feed more people during a pandemic and times of major food disruptions. Yeah, and we really wanted to frame this conversation as an update just for folks to understand the state of things right now, 2021, still in COVID. Um, you know, it's been a really dry, warm winter. Um, and so a check in really to see how things are going on the ground and then kind of where where the potential could go to continue to support a sustainable seed economy, um, a regionally adapted seed economy. So. Um, with that, um, Mai, tell us a little bit about how it's been in California this year in terms of the growing season and um, where things are at from your perspective as a farmer on the ground. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think as people are sheltered in place, it's hard to get a gauge as to what is going on in other parts of the state and especially in our growing regions. But in California, it's like you said, has been warm and dry. In January, we were experiencing temperatures around 85 degrees. So I was grateful and then trying, or I was enjoying what would be a lovely June day, except that it was in January, which is very disturbing to me as a farmer. Um, and really the, the implications were that our soil and moisture was very low. Um, I had to shift my plantings to be about a month and a half earlier than they normally would be. And um, now that we're further into the spring, I'm seeing that based on conversations with other farmers in California um, and also driving through the grain growing regions that really there's not going to be very much grain, very much wheat uh, in California this year. Uh, farmers that I know are tilling in their, their grains that because they were so stunted. And what I've seen is, you know, grain stalks being stunted, you know, at a foot or so, and the grain heads uh, also being shortened due to water stress at about a half an inch or an inch. And so that's just on the, the grain side, but also being connected with uh, vegetable growers. I'm chair of the Asian American Farmers Alliance. Many farmers are struggling uh, to, to have, have irrigation if they're dependent on wells and then concerned about how much they'll be spending on water if they're dependent on the municipal tap. So it's, it's been a really scary 2021 following uh, already really horrendous 2020 uh, that was detrimental to our farming communities. Many people were ill um, passed away or um, detained by ICE. Um, and then also, oh yeah, with the wildfires and the, the displacement and the sickness that resulted from that. 
Thank you for sharing. I know it's, it seems like the repercussions of, a, you know, climate change, all of these pressures, um, you know, and the discrimination pressures, the climate pressures, the, you know, the pandemic pressures um, have really just kind of come all together at a fever pitch. And it's, um, you know, what do you kind of see from here as, as being an adaptive strategy to move forward as a farmer? Um, what is your response been in terms of trying to mitigate the risk or where do you see that going? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny, like having talked with you for many years and um, having you invite me to speak about like my seed saving efforts and why, and it's like, I've been doing this work as a farmer to try to grow regionally adapted seeds, uh, seeds that are not patented and don't have restrictions such that I can grow them, save them, uh, share them with other farmers and, you know, have them acclimate To where I am and that's been really helpful and I really wish there was more support for that uh, more support financially and um, in terms of research for like regionally adapted organic growing systems of these the older varieties of wheat that also you know uh, have taller come to a taller stature so that's a lot of stock that's sequestering carbon and all of this work that you know we've been talking about for years that I thought was laying the groundwork for generations to come, trying to save seed for uh, you know food security and sovereignty, thinking about challenges that seem distant and now feeling its impact right now, um, and feeling like I'm not moving fast enough. But I guess what is really helpful is having a strong community and it's been important for me to feel like I, what I've been doing has been for this community and I can show up by creating new means for people to have steady access to, to the food that I'm producing and for that community to also step up and share risk with me as I'm, you know, facing nine months of having crop out there that's susceptible to disease, flood, fires, um, or landlords who might destroy the crop, as happened last year. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of kind of meeting all these risks and challenges, it's been key to just reconnect with people or, or strengthen our connections um, because what we've seen is that we can't rely on larger systems to take care of us. Um, it's been really disappointing, right? Um, when those grocery store shelves were empty, um, as people got sick, it's just, we still had to work. There wasn't anyone really like bailing us out. So, um, and for farm workers, it's like, we were really, we were really low on that vaccination eligibility list. So we really need to, to help each other. And so um, in this past year, you know, I lost a lot of my customers, restaurant bakery customers, and was able to shift more to engaging the home bakers that I know. And so I created um, several flower shares, one near where the farm is in Sonoma County and worked with a miller there. They're actually normally just, not just, but they mill for their bagel shop. And then they were so gracious in, in opening to mill my grains for this flower share. And then I've also been working with Nan at Griston Toll, who many people know, um, to have a flower share in Southern California. And uh, a part of that share option, there's a power flower share, which is, an option for people who really could make greater investments into our grain infrastructure, um, absent, you know, government aid in support of um, specialty grains like mine. And people were paying twice as much as the other grain share to get a few varieties that um, the sort of 
standard grain share members were getting. And, um, and that's been immensely helpful for me to be able to get, to afford equipment, grain cleaning equipment that I would otherwise have been driving three hours or six hours round trip to get cleaned and you know, facing all the obstacles of wildfires along the way, uh, which last year delayed cleaning for over three months. And that really delayed me being able to recoup my costs. So yeah, these means of having community supported agriculture. So people are paying in in advance so I can plan and the financial risks are shared. You know, that's been really key. And I hope that people seek out more farmers to make payments in advance for the grain that they'll be getting, whatever the farmer can harvest. Um, short of us making these larger policy changes that we need to shift subsidies so that they cover you know, all farmers and that like we all are getting this universal basic income and health insurance, healthcare and you know, childcare when we're doing essential work to feed everybody um, but bearing all of the risks as well. Hmm. Thank you for that. And it's, it's just, it's nice to just touch in as like you've done a year of this flower share now, you've kind of seen how it, how it functions and the model. Um, is there anything that you would, um, I, I, you're going to do it again, I'm hoping. Um, and I guess like, are there any kind of things that you've learned or things that you're going to pivot or change this year that um, are, you know, just making it, um, offering it for the second year? Yeah, I'm, I'm so impressed that with the Power Flower Share, we had 20 spots and um, that like sold out really quickly. And, and just the pace at which it was filling up what filled up, you know, way faster than at a faster rate than the other share option. So seeing the number of people willing to throw down for not just having the food, but building this infrastructure, it was just, it was really heartening to see. Uh, so I'll expand that. And um, it was helpful too to see that people were, were responsive to supporting the sliding scale for prices that we offered. So uh, uh, knowing that many people have been hit hard financially because of COVID, I offered different pricing tiers, even though they'd be receiving the same product. And it really relied above sort of the standard price just directly went to subsidizing the other shares. And so I, I will definitely do that again. People were very, you know, wrote in with a lot of gratitude for having subsidized shares. And um, also it's been great to see that people were responsive to the fact that, you know, we were having this shortened supply chain, right? Whereas farmer to miller to customer, and we weren't, using you know, our delivery systems that then expose far more people along this chain you know, to potential risk. And, and people were really supportive of that. And also you know, saying like, this is great, it really reduces our carbon footprint. And I, so I would totally do it again. And um, excited that the Power Flower Share too is something that it, that one did have a delivery option. So it did open up the opportunity for more people in California to engage and get food and also contribute to the, to the equipment expenses that um, will help build a new grain infrastructure in the economy. Awesome. It's so valuable to have your perspective as a value chain coordinator who's also the one actually needing to look at you know, growing conditions and soil health and pest management and varieties and, um, you know, sort of seeing this more complete picture um, from start to finish. Uh, and um, I'm wondering if there are ways that people can engage uh, with your work moving forward. Uh, you mentioned the Asian American Farmers Alliance um, and, uh, 
you know, obviously the flower shares are going to be up and running soon. I know you just had a, an article come out in CNN last week. So thing, things are looking, looking pretty uh, exciting PR wise, which is great. And congratulations. And um, yeah, just anything that you want to tell folks about how they can plug in or learn more or get involved or support you in your work. Yeah, thanks for asking that. And uh, certainly through my website or emailing me, people can sign up for my newsletter. That's very infrequent and brief <laughs> to get updates on actions uh, because I'm also involved in farm advocacy and policy. You know, include ways that people can make an impact on a broader region um, and not just through you know our dollars, but obviously we need to make institutional changes and the way that we institutionalize our community actions, our social movements is through our policy work and voting. And so um, people can, can engage by yeah, messaging me and being updated through the newsletter. And I, I really hope people will also seek out farmers near them who grow all kinds of things or produce all kinds of things from you know, our food and dairy to our fiber um, to understand how they can share risks with farmers um, if they are able to financially and then of course how do we get our our collective our government um, to also support us in sharing these risks while we're while we're while we're feeding you yeah i mean is that too much to ask goodness it just seems like <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, like, is the is that military budget more important than our food? I yes, I would. Mm. But um, yeah, we are seeing all these disruptions, and and as you had scrolled through my website, there was a brief mention of the 2021 outlook. If people are interested in understanding the um, current sort of global flows of food. Um, just of our trade in general and how that's been disrupted and the implications for uh, what it means for our food supply. You know, I've been trying to keep people abreast through through this blog that I've recently or resuscitated. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mai. And everyone, please sign up for their mailing list and uh, stay tuned for more information on flower shares. And I just want to say thank you for making time for us. I know that there's a lot going on right now and um, you know, you've got a family to take care of. So making a space to have this conversation is really, um, I'm just really grateful that you had, um, had some time and uh, I know that we will be airing this on Friday at the end of Grains Week. So folks will be really stoked about um, what's next and how to get involved. And we'll make sure to post your all your links and um, everything in the chat, in the YouTube chat. So thank you again. And if there's anything else you want to share before we end, we'll get it buttoned up here. No, thank you so much for including me and spending time with me, Abba, and asking these really important questions. And I think um yeah it's however however people can support farmers who are leading busy lives, leading busy lives. <laughs> i guess violin has come in so <laughs> All right. on that note <laughs> awesome thanks my <laughs> Hello and welcome again, everyone. My name is Abba Kaiser and I'm here with Mercy Karayuki McGee. I am the project manager of the WSU Food Systems Program and the Cascadia Grains Initiative. And I'm really thrilled to be talking with Mercy today about a new project that we are collaborating on to look at staple crops within BIPOC communities and their cultural relevance in Washington state. So with that, I'd like to welcome Mercy to tell you a little bit more about uh, the initiative. Uh, Mercy is a, a podcaster, a musician, and an artist, and an organizer. Um, uh, she runs a podcast called Shiro's Plate and is also um, a founder of the Hockey Farmers Collective uh, in Thurston County. So welcome, Mercy. 
Thank you so much, Amber, for the invitation to participate in this program. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here to be talking about why we need staple crop access for the BIPOC community, and um, especially in the times where we really need you know, the food for our BIPOC community. Uh, COVID has really stretched us thin, and um, there is quite a need for us to try and bring these healthy foods to the table so we can serve the communities that we live in better with healthy foods that matter to them most. Again, this project is in collaboration with the um, Wazoo Food System and other BIPOC farmers in Washington State uh, who, are, who are very enthusiastic about access, uh, food access for the BIPOC community that they serve throughout Washington. We are hoping this project can be a good example for other organizations and government and educational programs to help create this access for the diaspora community. So I'm here to talk about a little bit the approach we are taking on this program, on this uh, research, um, and how we expect to get some results out of it. A little bit of background about the BIPOC farming in the in, uh, in America in general. In the US, there's about 3.9 BIPOC farmer. 62% of those are laborers compared to 38% of white farmers in the US. Today, gaps still exist in agricultural system that limit access to land acquisition, farming, education, and capital for small to mid-scale BIPOC farmers. The barriers limit abilities to find solutions to introduce these food solutions for the BIPOC in regional and adapted staple crop markets. Research purpose. We need to think clearly how this research is going to be structured and what's the purpose of this research. We want to conduct quantitative and qualitative needs assessment of cultural relevant staple crops with BIPOC farmers and consumers. We want to be able to assess best practices, develop next steps to reviving regional and cultural relevant, sustainable for small to mid scale farmers, aim to understand the needs of the BIPOC farmers and consumers in our state identify gaps that exist within the BIPOC farmers and consumers in accessing healthy food, map pathways to establish a thriving regional market for the crops, such as the grains, the seed of grains, seed crops, pulses, oil seeds, and nuts. But we are not limited to this. As we go on with this research, we may open up more doors to looking at hubs and other important tools for the BIPOC community as well. The study design is very critical in a time when the BIPOC community are sounding the need to be included in these platforms. In order to be able to reach a wide survey, uh, a wide um, variety of uh, BIPOC community, we are going to use uh, Quartet, a platform that is widely used in educational programs and other systems to do surveys of all kinds of um, surveys that need to enrich the community. In our research study, we are hoping to survey at least about 500 consumers and we are also trying to reach at a tree that few farmers, at least 100 farmers in Washington state um, who are willing to participate. We are also going to be using a methodology that is called photo voice, which is a participatory action research method. It uses photos as a storytelling tool to inform and create social change. It allows participants to engage in a very passionate way, and it gives participants the power to shape the outcome of the research. If you Google photo voice, you'll see that it's widely used in communities around the world. And the outcomes have always been very, very, very good. Our participants are going to be farmers and consumers because we believe the two of them can decide how we're going to access these food sources. In our results and the expected impacts, we want to identify priorities that make sense for regional market development. We want to create a report and database for staple crops that are culturally relevant for specific BIPOC communities in Washington state. And again, we might be opening up for other states. We want to document what current barriers farmers face in growing, processing, and distributing these crops. We want to document what current barriers exist for consumers in accessing their culturally relevant staple crop. And consumers, we are talking about the BIPOC consumers. We want to invite participants to a gallery exhibition to access and quantify the results before we distribute the, the, the results to the broader community. And we also want to out and partners to implement recommendations derived from this research, which is very, very important in accessing the food for the BIPOC. We have to find a way to implement these recommendations. 
And with that, we come to the close of our, our short presentation. We are welcoming other people with questions if you'd like to learn about our project and other initiatives that we are taking on by our community, please reach us at Masikayoshi Magi. You can reach me at Hakikamas Collective at gmail.com. And Abba Kaisa, you can reach Abba at abba.kaisa at wsu.edu. And we welcome any questions. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Mercy. And I wondered if you could take a minute too to talk a little bit about the steering committee that we're working with, um, the importance of um, having a diverse uh, group of stakeholders who are, you know, engaged in the process and <clears throat> the, um, yeah, just the importance of the steering committee from your perspective. Yeah, thanks. That's very, very important to think about because when you're talking about um, working with BIPOC, we, we've, been, we've been left behind in so many decision-making levels of our agricultural system. And what has happened over the time, um, because the BIPOC have not been in the platforms for making these decisions on how the system works, we don't have much power in how things are directed. But with this project, we wanted to take a different approach. We wanted the BIPOC to be at the table, to be able to make the decisions of who we are going to be talking to, who are the consumers we are looking for, what are the food that we are going to look at, um, and what are the localities that we're going to be uh, serving. And this is because the BIPOC themselves, when the committee who have chosen to do this work, they are already working in these communities and they already know the need for the community that they, they work in and live in. In most cases, the BIPOC um, have a better storytelling when they're involved in the, in the work that they're doing. So we are hoping that by involving the BIPOC in our steering committee and giving them the leadership positions to lead this work, is going to have a larger impact in our communities. And, 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 and we also want to note that we are not just asking BIPOC to be at the table. We've asked our allies, our educators to be at the table with us, our researchers to be at the table with us, because this is the way we are going to understand what the needs are and how we can shape future research in um, understanding um, BIPOC communities and what their needs are. So we have a powerful team that's working with us. Um, this is a team of BIPOC farmers and researchers and um, educators from Washington State. And their voice is very powerful because they're on the ground will be doing this work and it's going to enrich the work that we're going to be coming out with at the end of this project. Beautiful. And it, it kind of leads me to another question that I have um, about, you know, where do you see this research going? I, you know, wildest dreams, um, you know, how does this kind of translate down the line? Um, in terms of research or resources or education or networks or, you know, I know we're early on in the project, but do you have kind of wildest dreams that you would, you, you have in mind for the direction that you'd like to see this go? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have been so excited about this research and that's the reason why I volunteered to do the work because at Hacky Farmers Collective, our model is to reclaim plant and um, to, to reclaim food and plant medicine for our BIPOC community. Um, and, and while we are doing this work, we are finding that there's a lot of information out there that is not captured, that there's small neighborhood farms that grow food for themselves and nobody else knows. So what this research is going to inform us is who is doing what in this community? Uh, what are the needs in this community? How do we get to this food? Because sometimes we have to travel very far to find the food that we left behind when we migrated to America or, or what has been lost within the African-American community that has been in, you know, embedded uh, or removed by the oppression that has existed in America for a long time. So my wildest dream is to be able to see a farm full of all these um, BIPOC staple crop growing or accumulated into these temperatures that we live in and um, seeing a, ma a, a market for it um, that is not saturated, a market that is not taken advantage of, but a market that actually serves the community in a very um, personal way. 
food is very personal and food food is at the heart of every community. So these communities are dying to have food that they love, food that they can sit around and talk about, food that they can connect their families with, and food that they can pass over to generations to come. The the generation of um of the BIPOC here um is hoping to to create a heritage, uh, to create a pathway for, for education, to create a pathway for their young adults to go into the fields of agriculture, to the natural resource management, to even own land to farm their own food. That is going to be very powerful. And I'm hoping this project can bring that awareness of the gaps that exist in the, in the agriculture system um, that we live in and that we depend on and, and realize that the BIPOC community has a need and has a need to be centered and, and not even more so with COVID where we're finding that the food that really works for you is the food that these families have been eating for a long time. So this can be um, an advantage for everyone. It could benefit the whole agricultural system when we have these foods being grown by the people who have the knowledge to do it, who have an understanding of what the food does to you, and also knows what it, how important it is for the future generation that's behind us. So yeah, I see farms farming these um, crops that we're going to identify and bringing that access closer to home to these communities. And, and I call it leveling the space because we are going to level what has been unleveled. Uh, we are going to bring these voices to the table and allow them to own land, to farm their own food. We are going to empower them. We are going to empower the young generation. So there is a lot I'm excited about. And Haki Farmers Collective cannot be more happy to partner with all the other black farmers and brown farmers in this state and beyond to make that a dream come true. Beautiful, I'm so excited. Um, and just really appreciate you sharing the, the enthusiasm and just um, seeing the potential for this to become a larger body of work and connect with obviously so many other bodies of work that are going on right now in Washington around supporting and elevating and um, you know really excavating the systemic racism within agriculture, um, specifically within Washington. And uh, just want to say thank you for all the work that you do to continue to have those conversations and speak the truth. And yeah. um, I, I guess I wanted to ask you as well about how you see this project addressing systemic racism within its very uh, structure. Um, and, you know, sort of we talked a little bit in designing the initiative about how for example, storytelling and qualitative data is often seen as not as, as um, scientific or, um, uh, or valid as um, quantitative data. And so kind of working with photo voice and doing photo document, documenting and, and doing more of a storytelling methodology as a, as a means of collecting data and how that um, contributes towards an anti-racist framework um, that really values the stories and the uh, and the, the generational knowledge, oftentimes, especially within elders um, of BIPOC communities, um, that, is, um, that is often overlooked. Yeah, um, you know, Haki Farmers Collective was founded after the, a summer of protest and organizing. And um, when we realized the need to organize around food and farm, um, and farm ownership and, and thinking about how the stories of food and the stories of farming have been lost and how personally myself, I've tried to bring my children along in the journey of talking about food, how we cook it, where it comes from, how it's been farmed. And, and we've realized that to be able to remove the barriers of the ag business that has existed and has left many black and brown farmers out of the picture for a long time. We have to, to reframe our, our, uh, our approaches. And one approach is to go back to the heart of the, of the food or the center of the problem. Um, 
So if we go into the communities that are suffering and ask them to talk to us about what is important to them and document that, we are creating some, some power of the voice. We are allowing them to speak up for the first time about their food. Um, and we are allowing them to be able to tell us why they don't get that food. And we might find some of the reasons why people don't talk about what their food systems look like in their backyard and, and what's lacking in our community. So we might be able to unveil a lot of, a lot of things that people don't always speak. Um, some of us are activists, so we talk. But some other communities are not activists, so they, they depend on what the government is giving or what the government is telling them to do and they don't have a voice at all. By doing photo voice, we are actually giving them the power to change the system. We are asking them to be part of the system, part of the voice, part of the, the design of the, of, the, of the research. And we are going to gather stories that have not been told for a long time. And these stories are going to stay with their families for a long time. Um, they'll be able to, to allow their families to hear those stories that often are told around the fires in communities of color, um, you know, um, or around food. When they talk about, oh, this is the food that your great great mother taught me how to cook. And unfortunately, we can't access this food here because we don't have a way to do it. So it's going to spark a conversation um, that a lot of us refuse to talk about this. It's going to allow us to have a candid conversation of how to remove the barriers of um, systematic racism. And, and it's going to allow us to face the consequences of not dealing with that, which is allowing black and brown people to be at the table um, of every decision level making and um, allow them to have the power to decide how their data is collected, how their stories are collected, and how their food is farmed as well. Um, and I think that's very powerful when people farm their own food um, and people feel like they have the power to decide what food they take into their bodies. That's very powerful. And, um, and also being able to be part of the change, um, creating policies that are going to make it that they can own land, creating policies that control how food is produced, creating policies that remove hate in our communities. Um, you know, research is there that shows that if you organize around these communities of color, you can remove crime and you can remove the, um, the, um, the stigma that people of color are lazy. People of color just want to be handed over something, which is not very true. We like to work really hard. We work for everything that we want, but we have to be given that space just as everybody else. So I think organizing around food and farm is a tool to removing uh, systematic racism. Uh, because that's where we've been left behind. That's where the fight is. That's where the shortcomings are. That's where the hate is. Um, that's where everything happens around food and fun. So this is very, very really powerful and is going to allow the younger generation to have a voice. So we want to start creating that generational pathways of social justice uh, advocates from our youth community as well. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mercy. I know you're going to be here on the, um, the Q&A um, as well. So we will see everybody in the chat. And um, thanks so much for joining. It's just been such a pleasure to get to know you. And um, I'm really excited for the work that we're doing together and just really grateful for your leadership as well. Um, in addition to the leadership of the steering committee uh, and uh, the folks who have contributed to this project so far. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amber, and I'm very thankful to be able to work with you. You, uh, you think forward, you think broadly, and I think you, it's some really important work that WASU is trying to undertake to change the systems. Um, and I can be more than happy to be part of this uh, change with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.
welcome. Hi, Mercy. Hi, thank you. I'm so sorry that that video got cut off and I'm, I'm so glad that people can see your beautiful face now. <laughs> I think um, every time you upload things to, you know, try to change the formatting and they either get squished yeah. or they get pulled out. So getting, so don't <laughs> worry. I think there's ways We've to had... fix that. We are here now, the, the message is Here up. we are, here we are. <laughs> We're at the end of our week here and we've just got a few minutes for some Q&A um, if you're up for it. Sure. So um, this isn't really a question, but maybe just something for you to comment on. Um, Sarah Cox says, this issue of science versus generational wisdom and historical silencing runs so deep overlapping with the conflict in the language of regenerative agriculture when it doesn't address systemic racism. You know, Sarah, you are so right on that. And it's something that many BIPOC struggle with. It's something that when we are talking about food sovereignty, um, land ownership, policies, regenerative um, agriculture and where did they come from? When having these discussions, I realized that this is something that happened in, in my families. Uh, when you think about like um, the Maasai people, you know, in the savannah, they move around with their animals, the, the nomadics, they move around with their animals. Why do they do that? Uh, to allow grass to grow elsewhere before they run it all down to protect the soil. So this, um, this, traditional methods that exist within the, the diaspora community are not new at all to the diaspora. And the only reason they seem very new to us um, is because we've been silenced, like Sarah says. We don't, they don't, we don't have a voice and we don't control how policies or farming or ownership of land is is supposed to happen. Um, that's why there's such a huge gap. And, and obviously we, we can't forget that, you know, African-Americans came here as slaves because they already knew how to farm. So their, their knowledge and their traditional skills were being taken advantage of and they just got really oppressed and buried so deep. So um, <clears throat> the, the, 20, the, the generation now, our generation and the generation behind us, you're starting to realize that how important that it is to start coming on top and, and talking about these issues openly and not having the fear. Obviously, some people sacrifice their lives to do this, but it's a conversation that has to happen and it needs to happen at, um, at every level of system. So yeah, we need to have that conversation about removal of voice and the systematic racism that exists. Um, and how do we how do we do that at every level of governance and community? And for us, I think we really feel like grassroots um, organizing is where everything has to start. Um, it happens all the time around the world in the indigenous communities around Africa. They, they do a lot of grassroots organizing. So yeah, so it's something that we have to have a conversation about all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that mm -hmm. comment, Sarah. Very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, in our grant proposal for this project, we talked about the discrepancies that you mentioned in your PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. But I think, and I don't know for sure, but I feel like within, you know, there's systemic racism within agriculture, but then within grain systems, it seems like there might even be a farther jump um, there just based on the amount of land you have to have access to to make it profitable, based on mm -hmm. the knowledge of how to harvest and the equipment that you're gonna need to purchase to be able to you know, uh, mill and distribute and clean. And um, you know, I don't know any millers of, of color um, you know, in Washington at this point. Um, and you know, that's kind of, I guess what we're trying to identify with this project is just getting a clearer picture of who's out there, mm -hmm. what are their needs, what foods are important to them. And then if there are staple crops that fit within that, how can we support closing the loop on BIPOC farmers and BIPOC consumers and just BIPOC farmers in general to have more support for the for staple crops that are important to them for growing and for sustaining regional markets? 
Yeah, <clears throat> and it, it's um there's this um commercial of uh, food systems that uh, drain the resource from the small scale farmers. So um so there's never enough uh there's not funding enough for for black and brown farmers to engage in this commercial farming and also it's because because of the systematic racism the generational world of farms being passed from one family member to the other doesn't exist so we don't have that generational world to be able to do that at a at a, a, a bigger scale also if you're looking at most diaspora we are immigrants here so we are going to be first generation farmers so but but really the key is removing the barriers of financing so black and brown farmers can have um access to that financing that everybody else has had so and and most of the black farmers have been ranchers so why ranchers? Um, I think we can get them to do other things, contribute to the economy, just like everybody else is. But again, it goes all back to that systematic racism and the oppression that has happened over time and trying to remove those barriers. So when we do this research, we can at least um, point the, the farmers who are ready to move to that direction where these these fundings are where where they can farm, what the climate zones are required. All these things are going to be very, very critical as we do this research to inform the, 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 the broader community of BIPOC how they can engage in farming in America in a 21st century as well, where things, mm -hmm. we have short times for planting, we don't have tropical weathers. How do you do that? So we have to understand all those things. What soils look like here? Those are things that this research can answer to help these farmers to access these farming practices and get into the ag enterprises as well. Yeah, yep. Well, hopefully what we're doing can lead more, lead down that road. And um, we're gonna break now and just uh, take a little moment to pour ourselves a glass of something. Yeah. I personally have a PBE, which is a precious black energy from Metier Brewing that they, uh, that we went to Woodenville to film with them and we got some of this from their, their black owned brewery. It's, it's amazing. Um, dry and effervescent IPA, uh, bursting with aromas of peaches and dragon fruit. So I hope that y'all can take a minute and grab a drink and come back in just a second here and cheers with us. Um, but Mercy, thank you again for all your work and for anybody who wants to get involved, just um, head over to the Hockey Farmers Collective website. You can sign up for their newsletter and um, you can also sign up on CascadiaGrains.com to get updates about this project as well. Um, so thank you so much. And um, we'll be right back after this message. Thank you. familiar screen, isn't it? So very many <laughs> calls that have looked like this one. Hey, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Everybody ready to, I'm going to, I'm going to run through a few uh, 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 thank yous, a little formalities, and then we'll cheers to a great week. Um, uh, first of all, these the uh, Grains Week was brought to you by funding from two USDA NIFA grants, uh, OREI funded the uh, Developing Multi-Use Naked Barley for Organic Farming Systems mm -hmm. and Evaluated Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems. Um, the organizing teams were from Culinary Breeding Network, Oregon State University Barley World, University of Wisconsin, Cornell University, Seed to Kitchen Collaborative, eOrganic, 
Artisan Grain Collaborative, Grammys Grains, Cascadia Grains, and the WSU Food Systems, and my new home team, Glenwood, the Center for Regional Food and Farming. Um, like to thank Alice and Abba for doing a great job on tech and holding it down through many, many hours of Zoom. You guys are awesome. Uh, we want to thank Claire, uh, Kate Blairstone for the beautiful, amazing artwork. I'm in love with all of those pieces, the Greenswick artwork where she combined all of the different crops and then we've occasionally got some images of the singles that she's done, just, just beautiful. Um, prints are for sale. I think they're still on sale. There's a special for Grains Week if you go to her website. Um, uh, good Christmas presents or, or whatever your, your holiday occasions to celebrate might be. <laughs> um, we want to thank all the participants who presented and gave their time to share their knowledge and their enthusiasm for the things that they're working on, their experience. You know, benefit from that creates great community. Um, <clears throat> there is a survey, uh, as this is from grant work, there's always a survey to be concluded with. So um, please fill out your survey that will come in multiple forms. Uh, Lane will put that in the chat. It will also go out in emails to folks uh, who registered for Grains Week. Um, and if you missed any of the sessions during the week, everything is pre recorded and available on YouTube free of charge. This is all USDA funded programming for the benefit of uh, making greater sustainable agriculture. Um, Thank you to everybody who tuned in, tuned in this week. I'm sorry, I'm stammering. Um, and who are catching up after uh, the live events. The, the numbers have been inspiring to see everybody who's been interested in this topic. And we want to just thank everybody for participating and, and acknowledge that wherever you are on the value chain, your participation matters and where you choose to buy your flour, your whiskey, your beer, your bread, um, has an impact literally on the people who grow our food and the people who make our food and the soil that sustains all of us and hopefully will sustain us into the future. Um, and with that, we especially wanna thank the farmers who are obviously on the ground and dealing with these realities uh, more than any of us have to deal with on a daily basis. So thank you for feeding us and thank you to everybody uh, who participated. It's been a wonderful event to work on with you all. I'm, I'm so proud and honored. So cheers. I'm of course having an empire rye, if anybody wants to know. <laughs> cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. I don't have a beer, but cheers. <laughs> I'm on my afternoon coffee. <laughs> Sorry. A beer a sounds bit. awesome, actually, but I've got to take my kids to baseball practice. <laughs> Hi, Joni. Thanks for dropping in. I'm sorry I couldn't join in earlier. Um, I'm looking forward to catching up on YouTube this weekend to many of the talks as well. So nice to see you. You too. Thank you for participating. Thank you, everyone. That was a great program. I've already caught up on a lot that I missed and it was awesome. Thank you. Great. We're I've gotta be, cut out um, and run my kiddos. So I'm gonna peace out and let's all keep in touch. Good to see you all right. briefly, bye. Sounds good, y'all. I wanna well, shout out to Amber. I wanna oh, shout out to me. Amber. I want to shout out to Amber. <laughs> she worked extremely hard. Um, she was out recording this, these videos to bring them on and keeping her normal life. And uh, thank you, Amber, for all you do. Really appreciate mm, it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mercy. It's such a pleasure to work with you. And I'm so excited about our the initiative that we're working on together. And um, yeah just really grateful for your perspective always and your generosity. And I want to thank Lane as well for bringing us all together 
for saying, hey, you guys over there and you guys over there and you guys over there, let's all get together and try to fit 10 pounds of content <laughs> into a one pound bag and try to make it work. And I think it, I think it did. And it I, great. you know, I, I also want to acknowledge Alice, who's been with me throughout the whole week as my backup, per, like tech, uh, you know, savant. So it just, it's just a big thank you to, especially to you too, but also for, to the, those two on the organizing team. So cheers to oh, you. You, Alan, yes. Like it's real easy to be like, hey guys, let's all get together and do this. See you later. <laughs> And it's like, you have really made it happen. You made all these online things happen that would not happen without. So super appreciative of you. And Alice also take, taking in and being, I mean, it's really exhausting. So yeah, well, it's everybody. just been incredible to work with this group and every single member of the team has been just great and has done their part and everybody, we got all those videos together. And um, so thanks to everyone for all the great work that you're doing and also just for getting all this done on time and rounding up so many people and bringing so many different people together. So, you know, even though we've been on Zoom all week, <laughs> it's been an incredible <laughs> week. So yeah, it's been great to hear from so many different people. It's interesting to do a conference while you're like baking in your kitchen. <laughs> it has its good and bad points, but, um, but thank you all so much. I have to run, but cheers. And this was awesome. Bye, Adrian. Bye. I can't wait to see you all in person too. My gosh. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need some food for sure. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to say, Abba, for as much as you're juggling, you've, you're also incredibly patient. So thank you for the, you know, willing to repeat things and just the, the everything it takes to keep it going, like with uh, your cool as a cucumber. Thank you. I'm and just following your lead. This uh, is good. Our, it's the good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah. And Lane, thanks for posting this on the culinary breeding Hey, no. I am honored. I am so honored to have this in this space and that, and that it's living here now for us to come back and have others come to. And um, yeah, I really am honored to, to be able to be like the, the platform for this to, to be on. So thank you. Green boss. <laughs> Exploring new pronouns, I think. Yes, I like that one. <laughs> Love it. People are posting in the chat what they've been doing this week while they've been tuning in. Oh, no. <laughs> Sarah's been farming with us all week on the, on the Bluetooth, which is now jammed with dirt, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the best when it's like farmers will tell you that they're, you know, they're not, you know, they're doing other things and they've got it in their, their ears and listening and tuning in all day. You know, it's fantastic. It's, it makes it feel like, you know, it's worth it. We've done a good job at it. But as a reminder, fill out the evaluation. <laughs> and I will be emailing everyone that registered. Um, and I also posted in there where to buy Kate's artwork. And as June mentioned, there's artwork. She has two sizes, actually. I think I only posted about one. She has a smaller eight by 10. And then she's got a bigger like 16 by 20. And it's really beautiful. And then she does um, gift wrap too, which is really awesome. Um, very fun support your local artist. Thanks so much for making that connection, Lane. That has been so much fun to have such beautiful art to promote and uh, connect with this great programming. Yeah, it's, it's great. I was very happy to do it. Cool. All well, right, guys, are we gonna get up and like move around? <laughs> Go yeah. outside? What is that? <laughs> Yeah, I hope you have a very screenless weekend, Abba and Alice, especially. <laughs> you have earned it. Yeah. Thanks so much for being well. a part of this. And yeah, we'll see you down the road, maybe in person. Who knows? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll see. And then thanks, Julia, for stepping up and doing some of your first conference presenting and Leo, too. Of course, I owe it all to you, June. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're natural. <laughs> You're good. Hi, Leo. 
How's it going? Good. Good. Uh, this, this was a blast. Yeah, Julie, you did do a great job. Teammate. <laughs> Teammate. Great. Uh, this whole week was amazing. So oh, good. Yeah, and so glad that it's recorded because yeah, I, I, I was tuned in for most of it, but definitely look forward to going back, picking up on a few things. Yeah, we'll go in and put the timestamps on it too. So you'll be able to like see which, you know, the whole day you'll see the presentation, you click it and it'll just go to that part. So you don't have to. Yeah, you know, the scroll through the whole thing. Good to know. Yeah, I think this content will be paying dividends for a long time. Yeah, we've had a lot of viewers. Yeah, a lot of information shared this week. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Alice, did you want to say oh, something? Oh, yeah, you know, I did. Back. And I realized that my headset was muted because I was sitting on it. But basically, um, I was going to say that you can embed individual presentations when the timestamps are there on your own website. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. so if you have something for your organization that you particularly want to showcase on your website, you could embed that from the YouTube um, as long as the timestamps are there. That's a great tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were just talking about that this morning. So. Great. We'll have those done All right, soon. everybody. Well, I'm going to go out and start planting my buckwheat field in my yard. So. <laughs> I'll just mention a couple other collaborators who aren't here at the end, but Mark Sorrells, Julie Dawson oh, yeah. also. And Bridget. Mm -hmm. Bridget Mites. Thank Bridget you. Bridget did such an incredible job. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The three breeders aren't here. I wonder what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Drinking beer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. very different from what we're doing right now. <laughs> well, they're in Oregon, so well, it was Julie's in Wisconsin. They're drinking roasted barley tea. Hopefully. All right. Thank you all. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting everybody. You too. Thank you. 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 Thank